I'd like to uh, call the meeting to order, if I could, please. Um, we do have quorum, and I, um, as I said, I'd like to call the meeting of the Budget Subcommittee for City Hall and Etobicoke Civic Centre uh, consultations to order. Uh, this is a meeting, uh, one of a series that are happening all across the city. Uh, for the opportunity for us to hear public deputations uh, on the 2020 capital and operating budgets. Uh, I'd like to welcome members of the committee, uh, subcommittee, and of course members of council. Can I have everybody in the back of the room please um, keep their voices down? I respect that everybody's here, but we're trying to uh, begin the meeting. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the land we're meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishwabi, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. You can follow the meeting on your computer, tablet, or smartphone at toronto.ca slash council. Are there any... Can I... Can I please have everybody in the back of the room... We need order in the room. Uh, if you have any conversations, can you please take them outside of the room? It's difficult as we're trying to begin uh, the process of deputations. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Interest Act? Seeing none. Now, I do want to let everyone know, and first of all, welcome everybody who's coming before us to depute. We're looking forward to the opportunity to hear your, your questions, concerns uh, about the budget, but we do have a lot who are registered. Um, and we may not get through the uh, up till 5 p.m. depend with what is on the actual list. Uh, so I'd like to move the following motion: that speakers who have not pre-registered for the 9:30 to 5 p.m. session of City Hall consultation be allowed to register up until 10 a.m. this morning, January 20th, 2020. After which, no further registration is allowed, and speakers the speakers list will be closed for the 9:30 to 5 p.m. session. Uh, again, just with the volume of people, we want to make sure we get through everybody by 5 p.m. Doesn't mean you can't speak to us. If you want to speak to in the evening session, you can contact the clerk and you can be added to the evening session. All in favor? Oppose? That's carried. The uh, subcommittee is going to recess today at 12.30 and again resume at 1.30. If we have not finished the speaker's list at 5 p.m., we're going to recess until 6 p.m. and then finish the list before hearing from speakers who have registered for the 6 p.m. PM session. I do want to remind um, deputants that there is a five-minute maximum uh, to present to us. I will remind you about 10 or 15 seconds prior to that. Um, again, I'm going to try to keep the deputations concise to five minutes. We do have a lot of people, uh, and we want to ensure that everybody has a fair opportunity to be able to speak to us. If you are part of a, an organization or a group, um, I always suggest that you combine your deputations, if there's three or four people, if you combine them all down to one, uh, one deputation or a couple of them, uh, number one, it speeds things along, but it also, it, again, it benefits everyone by the end of the day that we have that opportunity to speak with you. Other than that, I just want to also remind um, people who are deputing, even though there's two, we have three councillors who are on the subcommittee, Councillor Mike Layton, Councillor Francis Nunziata, and myself, you may have other councillors who will be coming in and out during the day, and we do have a lot of people who actually watch the proceedings in their offices. So though you may not see a lot of councillors here, uh, you will be speaking probably to a lot more people when you speak in front of us. I'm not trying to make you nervous or anything, but uh, there are a lot of people who actually watch this on their, t on their TVs in their offices. So on that, um, we will begin um, again. The speaker's list is a green sheet. I think everybody uh, has them. Um, we'll start with the first speaker. Uh, what I'll do is I'll name three or four speakers, so if you can get prepared to come up, uh, you'll be speaking on there. There's a little button that you have to press. Uh, and if you've been here before, you know the process. So I'll begin with uh, Kevin McCarthy from the Toronto Professional Fires Association. After that will be Dan Bingham and then Ellen Golden. Golden. Welcome, Kevin. Again, five minutes and... Uh... Thank you. Good morning, Council. Um, my name is Kevin McCarthy. I'm Vice President of the Toronto Professional Firefighters Association. We thank you for the opportunity to come before the Budget Committee today to comment on the 2020 staff-recommended TFS operating budget. 
The Toronto Professional Firefighters Association represents 3,000 firefighters that perform various roles within Toronto Fire Services, including frontline emergency responders, fire prevention investigators, public educators, fire investigators, emergency communicators, and equipment and mechanical services. TFS is the city's only all hazards response agency. We provide Toronto residents, visitors, and businesses with protection against loss of life and property and the environment from effects of fire, illness, and accidents and all hazards through preparedness, prevention, public education, and emergency responses. Our members are proud to carry out the responsibility in an effective and efficient, safe manner while understanding our commitment to the quality of service. We are in support of the staff recommended fire service operational budget. We do so cognizant of the fact that maintaining the status quo and emergency response resources cannot continue. I draw your attention to the performance measures graph on page 12 of the 2020 budget notes for TFS. The top graph demonstrates the challenges associated with achieving industry recognized standard NFPA 1710 when it comes to gathering the required effective firefighter forces on scene of a fire emergency within 10 minutes and 24 seconds, 90% of the time. The effective firefighter force is the personnel required to safely fight a structure fire for traditional two-story dwellings. It would be 17 firefighters. In 2016 and 2017, TFS met the standard. In 2018, TFS saw a decrease in response capabilities that dropped our ability to meet the standard to only 88% of the time, opposed to the 90%. In 2019, TFS saw a further drop to 87%. The second performance measures graph on page 12 demonstrates TFS's ability to meet the standard NFPA 1710 for the arrival of first fire apparatus on the scene of a fire emergency. The recognized standard requires the first fire truck to arrive on scene within six minutes and 24 seconds, which is measured from the receipt of the call for help. In 2016 and 2017, TFS met the standard 83% of the time, not the desired 90%. In 2018, our ability to arrive on scene with the required 6 minutes and 24 seconds dropped to 82%. In 2019, it further dropped to 81%. We attribute this reduction in response to capability to city's growth as well as increased travel times and congestion. We must keep in mind the city continues to grow vertically. We are faced with increased challenges. High-rise fires require two and a half more fire personnel than single-family residents. The added vertical height also compounds the difficulty in meeting response time performance standards. Toronto Fire Services, along with Toronto Police and Toronto Paramedic Services, are experiencing a continued yearly increase in demand for emergency response services. This is demonstrated on the top of the graph on page 13. Another factor that impacts our ability to respond at a high level of efficiency is staff shortages. We are pleased to see the staff recommended budget include a two-year pilot program that proposes to replace firefighters who are unavailable for duty due to unpanned illness or injury, including WSIB-related absences with existing staffing resources. This program should help us maintain our emergency service response times at today's levels and may see us improve times by 1% over last year. To summarize, the TPFFA is supportive of the 2020 staff-recommended TFS operational budget. We'll continue to work with Chief Pegg and his team to ensure that we are operating as effective and efficiently as we can. Having said that, we do caution that continue to try to meet increasing demands in future years with existing resources will not help us in striving to improve our performance standards and may continue on moving us further away from desired standards and re response times. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Any questions? Excellent. Appreciate that. Next will be Dan Bingham. St. Stephen's Community House. Welcome. Again, you have five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, council members. Thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Daniel Bingham, and I am a representative of the Member Advocacy Committee at St. Stephen's Community House. We advocate on behalf of those whose time is occupied right now with just trying to survive. I hope my story will help you decide to provide a budget increase for city services for those less fortunate in Toronto. I am seven years sober now. My recovery was aided by a number of agencies, including Ossington Detox, provided, which provided intake into the system, the Gerstein Centre, 
that helped me access health and sober services, Transition House that gave me sober living and addiction awareness, Canterbury Clinic, Clinic assisted me with mental health and recovery, Oasis Employment Services helped me with job reintegration, St. Stephen's Community Health helped me with computer skills, resume building, and peer support training that I successfully completed, as well as drop-ins. There are a few of the services, these are just a few of the services that helped me. All of these agencies have experienced cutbacks in recent years. There is less access for an ever-increasing number of people to these programs. There's an urgent need for the city to increase funding for these services as people are dying. In particular, we need an increase in funding for drop-ins across the city. Drop-ins provide needed meals and services such as doctors, nurses, and enable people who are homeless to make social connections. The drop-in budget needs at least a 2% increase, we'd like more, and it has been flatlined for way too long. You know, there's an old Midas muffler commercial which people in Toronto may be familiar with. A customer was asking whether he should fix the muffler problem now or should he wait? And the wise mechanic said to him, well, now you can pay me now or you can pay me later. In seven years, I have changed from being an alcoholic drug addict, suffering from depression and about to be evicted and to be homeless, to now where I am the vice president of one condo board, chief signing officer for a second. I've taken peer support training and I sat on the board of four charitable organizations, one of which I helped to create. I also work in the entertainment industry and I've started my own renovation company. And as I told council last time, I am not finished. In short, because of social services, I am now a very productive member of this wonderful city Without access to these services, the alternative could have been that you're hearing about my obituary instead of my success. Many cities and countries around the world see the value of providing social health and health services and counting the successes as opposed to only providing emergency services and counting the cost of people's lives. You know, I know if you guys are wondering where this money is coming from, that it is a lot cheaper to be preventative than it is to, to go through the emergency uh, services. Emergency services are usually upwards of 10 times more expensive. I thank you providing, for providing me this opportunity to address you today. Yours in service, Daniel Bingham. Thank you, Daniel. Questions? Perfect, concise. Thank you very much. Next is Ellen Goulden. Golden. Ellen Goulden. Ellen Goulden not here. Okay, next we'll go on to Tim Kukur, then David Cox, then Marianne Scott after that. Welcome, Tim. Again, you'll have five minutes, and I uh, look forward to hearing you. Great, thank you. Good morning, Councillor Crawford, Councillors. Uh, I'm Tim Coker, Executive Director of the Waterfront Business Improvement Area. I'm here to speak briefly on a few of our priority items where the city has been supportive and we look forward to continuing to work together toward a well-connected destination waterfront that's beautiful and vibrant all year round. So first, uh, winter tourism and the city's public art strategy. I want to highlight that our BIA has taken the lead in bringing interactive art installations to our waterfront again this winter. Winter Stations Presents Loop, which is on the right in this image, is actually out there right now. You can check it out at York and Queens Key until February 9th. <laughs> Hamster wheel. And uh, we strongly encourage the city to expand its winter tourism program so that we can continue to expand on programs like Winter Stations. And Councillor Cressy, since you're here, I should thank you very much for your support in this and the other initiatives that I mentioned today. Uh, next up, the Gardner Corridor. So the we're all familiar with the Bentway and then the City and Waterfront Toronto's work with Underpass Park. They've really shown the potential of our Gardener underpasses to have a friendlier, more welcoming experience for users. People have to go under the Gardener to get to our waterfront. And this year we developed a vision to improve these north-south connections, the Waterfront Reconnect vision from Ken Greenberg and Public Work. And this pilot in the images at Rees Street was just completed in partnership with the City, including the uh, Economic Development and Culture's BIA office. 
We encourage the City to continue working with us and other stakeholders along the Gardner to have a corridor plan in place for a better, world-class experience through all of downtown under the Gardner when the Gardner rehab is complete. And lastly, I'll bring up the, uh, the Waterfront East LRT. According to an economic impact study prepared by Hatch for RBIA, a waterfront LRT built through the Portlands by 2025 would support 24 billion in new tax revenue by 2045, including 10 billion in municipal tax revenue. We're grateful to see funding of next steps for design of the Waterfront East LRT included in this budget. This will make the project eligible for full transit funding soon. This year, the city will also consider prioritization of four to five billion in available transit funding. The waterfront LRT would speed up the build out of the most exciting development zone on the continent. More than 67,000 new residents and 132,000 new jobs along the LRT corridor through the Portlands. We encourage the city to use its available transit funding to accelerate the waterfront East LRT. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Questions? Excellent. Thank you, Councillors. Thank you. Next is David Cox. Welcome, David. Good morning. Can I give you a handout? If you can give, actually give them to the clerks and they will hand it over for us. Thank you. Thank you. You have five minutes. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me here. My name is David Cox. I live in Etobicoke and I'm here as a private citizen. I have appeared at the uh, previous hearings, but mostly out in the West End. Um, the reason I'm here is to make a request that the City of Toronto, and in conjunction with them, the Centre for Urban, Ren I forget what they call it, CUR over at Ryerson, um, exclude from future budget documentation misleading information that somehow seems to feed the media as to why property tax increases are justified. If you look at the uh, second slide, you'll see that there's a chart that everybody seems to know about, where Toronto is placed right at the, virtually at the bottom. And uh, we have a caption over on the right-hand side referring to an article in the National Post saying uh, Toronto is doing the right thing with the, uh, a gradual hike. This was published in the uh, CUR website, which is part of Ryerson. And uh, on the page afterwards, you'll see that the Globe and Mail has picked up the same message. The Star has picked up the same message. Everybody who reads those papers is being conditioned to the fact that it's time for a property tax increase in this case, this year is going to be obviously higher than normal. I'm not against needing more revenue, but I do think that uh, using this kind of data is uh, ignoring the warnings from where this data came from. The data came from uh, the annual BMA municipal study, and that study makes it quite clear that given the number of factors used to calculate the assessed value for each property, and the inability to quantify each of these factors, the results should be used to provide the reader with overall trends rather than exact differences. In fact, this is exactly contrary to what the City of Toronto budget is doing. In fact, if I were to take the logic of uh, the way the City of Toronto shows its data, the part of the city that should have a mammoth tax increase would seem to be Toronto East because Toronto East is at the bottom of the uh, scale when it comes to type of housing and the type of tax paid. Uh, I'd also suggest the committee and councillors should take a look at an article about the floor of averages, about how you can distort data using averages, which is exactly what is happening with the city uh, presenting its budget in this way. Finally, I guess I would say, yes, we need to increase revenue, but at the same time, we've failed to eliminate waste, we've failed to take advantage of technology, and we have an abysmal track record when it comes to managing major projects. 
these are the things that we need to work on, then I think you'll find taxpayers will be willing to accept a tax increase. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Uh, next uh, three speakers are Marianne Scott, Tasfa Tess Scott, and Salam Scott. Hi, good morning. Good morning, good morning everyone. Good morning. Thanks. Um, so um, I do have a few extra speakers with us. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of get them out of the way because they're young people, and I don't know if they can last here for the whole day. So I'm asking for your permission. Um, they'll just probably be one minute. It won't be very long. But I'm asking for um, your permission to um, allow them to speak alongside with me. Um, I, I'm, their, their voices are very important to me. And um, if you guys would allow that, I would appreciate it. There are two extra speakers among me and the three other ones. I'll move to vary the order paper to. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm just curious. So some of them, some of some of you are actually on the list. Yes, three, four of us, four of us. Yes. Oh, okay. So I just what I'd probably do is even give me the names so I could at least take are, them off. Are on the list. Okay. So, but are, are on the list. So, um, okay. Oh, on the list. So, um, so who would be just so I could mark them off so we don't have to come. So, so just. Takari. What's your name? Takari. Ken. Takari. Okay. Tara Kenton. Kenton. Lamb. Okay. And Tesfa. And Tesfa. Next. And and me, Marianne. Okay. Wonderful. And the two and so the three is Abba. Davis. Okay, so there's a couple that you're adding on. Marcus Garrison. Okay. So you have okay, we, we got about four or five. Okay. <laughs> no not. Excellent. <laughs> Okay, so we'll give a bit of leeway on, on sort of the timing of this. You generally have five minutes each as a number of you, so we'll, I'll just sort of, you know, the, if we got, you got about 10 or 15 minutes when you're looking at all of you, we'll just sort of see how the deputations go. I'm so scared. And I'll let you, so you're Marianne, of course. Okay, I think Salem wants to go. Okay, I will let you all start speaking. Hi, okay, oh my God. Hi, my name is Salem Scott, and I'm 15 years old from Regent Park. And I'm here with my peers to talk about the social development plan and the community benefits agreement, which is for Regent Park. We need your support to create a sports team for the children and youth of Regent Park. Right now, I'm working with Paint Blocks to create a safe space for the youth of Regent Park so that they can come and be creative and, ex and express themselves. My concern is that there aren't enough spaces we can go in the community for our children and youth to go. If we had enough funding, we could get a chance to introduce the social development plan. With your support, by funding the social development plan and the community benefits agreement, we will make it possible for the children and youth of Regent Park to reach their full potential. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and thank you, Councillor Wong Tam and your fellow councillors for the opportunity to speak. My name, my name is Tesfa Spencer. And like, um, thank you for letting me out. Thank you for giving me the chance to speak today. I'll just talk to you guys about the social development plan and what it means to like most of us here, youth. Cause it's like, it's like building us for the future, giving us somewhere we, where we wanna go for sports and other things like that. Like, cause it will help us in the future to know where we want to go and to know what we want to do. Like, for cause sports, sports is a big thing in youth, in youth, because youth, they evolve through sports and they help, sports helps them a lot through like terms, like emotional terms and stuff like that. So I'm saying, like, if like, the social development plan as my sister was saying, like if we get funded for that, it'd be a big help for most of the youth in Regent Park. And yeah, thank you uh, everyone for letting me speak today. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, my name is Liberty Hesse and I'm 13 years old, girl born and raised in Regent Park. 
I'm here to talk about the development plan and the community benefits agreement. We want your support to bring more programs and opportunities to the youth in Regent Park community. We enjoy extracurricular activities like basketball, volleyball, soccer, and swimming and dance. We would like to we would like it to be continued, but we want to be involved in things that give us experience and opportunities for when we get older. We are um, these programs are not just for the kids living in Regent Park today, but it's also for the kids in the future. I would like it if you take what I just said. Um, I don't know what to say. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Abba. I'm 14 years old and I go to Central Tech and I live in Regent Park. And right now I'm on the basketball team and football team and, I, and I'm here to support Regent Park Social Development Plan. I think it would be good if we got more sports teams in my community because it would bring our communities together and me and my peers would not have to travel far distances to go do the things we love. Creating sports teams will create job opportunities for the youth and young adults in Regent Park. If you help us create a football team, it would bring, community, it would bring together our communities, close communities and communities close by like Bleecker, Moss Park, and Esplanade. This will lessen the rivalry, rivalries we have for each other. Please support our community and the social development plan so we can make Regent Park safer for everyone. Thank you, counselors, for listening to me. Hi, my name is Natir, and I am um, 10 years old. I live, I've been living in Regent Park for my whole life. Um, <laughs> He's gone now. It has has made me because become a better person, and I like living in Regent Park because it has a lot of sports and programs after school programs. I really enjoy. I would like to see more programs that help building us to become a better person. I would like to. I would like to see programs that will make me become a better person and teach us how to be our own boss. Thank you for letting me speak. Hi, hi, my name is Takare. I, oh, I live in New York Park, I'm 10 years old. I, I'm here to support the social, the I don't even know that word. <laughs> the verb, development plan. For Regent Park, I would like to see more sports teams in Regent Park, especially football. A football team would help us support each other and bring our community together. Having a football team will keep me focused and away from gangs. I want to grow up and prove my teachers wrong that I can make it and go to university and play football. Thank you to all the I don't know that word for talking, taking the time to listen to me. Good morning. Thank you very much for giving this youth the opportunity to speak. My name is Marianne Scott, and I am here in support of the Social Development Plan. I know by now you remember who I am and see that my passion for young people is very vibrant and I want to create positive outcomes for them at every avenue. One area I want to focus on is sport and employment. I feel they go hand in hand. I understand that the city does not fund sports teams slash leagues, but we, but we, I, just need a hand up to get the ball literally rolling. I'm exploring other funding sources as I move through this process. Sports teams opens up so much doors for children and youth. It can lead to employment, higher education, and the possibility of representing our country, as my daughter Charity Williams has been able to do. Some of these children present today was present through Regent Park Recreation Center summer camps to see Charity and her team off to 
at City Hall uh, four years ago for Rio, thanks to the mayor, and she was one to them. It was her, it was her early involvement in Parks and Recs that allowed her to reach her full potential. Sports, as we know it, is good for the body, mind, and soul, and is also healing. These children that are here today, unfortunately, have experienced trauma. Sadly, from what, from what the forecast shows us, we'll continue to have ex these lived experiences of death due to violence around them. I want to change that outcome on, for, for these youth, one youth at a time, and I leave no one behind. I am confident I can do that with the help from you today. The social development plan and revitalization can't just be about investing in infrastructure. We need to invest in young people, in lives. I have started a movement at City Hall. I hope. I don't ever want to come before you without the future, which are these youth. I decided the day their friend Makai died a year and a half ago, at a day after he turned 15, that I was going to do everything in my powers to limit the negative experiences, and I hope to do this through sport with them. This is what they asked for. We need to listen more to our young people because they know what they want. Thank you very much for listening to me. Um, hello, my name is Marcus Grandison, and I am a Simon Fraser University football coach. I also am a former uh, Toronto Argonaut, and I am a community organizer. I'm from the Jane and Finch neighborhood, which is also a priority neighborhood, just, as, just like Regent Park. And I'm here to show, to show you an example of 15 years. I was just like these young men and women 15 years ago. Um, football had allowed me to create relationships that I I've, I've still have to this very day through football. Um, it brought me social skills that uh, I was able to develop through going into different environments and meeting different people. And I feel when, when my auntie came to me and she, and she wanted me to speak to you guys, I felt like it was extremely important to know my, my side of the story and just looking at an actual representation of what uh, youth football programs or youth programs can do, especially in sport. So I just really wanted to say thank you for your time and that we should be, we should be able to look deeply into these, these young men and young women's futures. And I just feel like sports is a great way for us to actually keep intact and mentor them because you don't even, we don't even understand maybe just two minutes of a, of a conversation during practice is that two minutes of conversation that that young man or that young woman needed for that day to actually get their mind right. So uh, thank you very much. I won't take too much of your time, but thank you for letting me talk. Thank you. Is there any questions from any of the councillors who would like? Councillor Wong Tan. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the deputants for coming out to speak today. With respect to the social development plan, um, it is a critical component of having that plan funded in order for the Regent Park overall revitalization to be successful. Is that not correct? Anyone can answer that, please. Yes, definitely it is. Um, we, we know that they've, I mean, a lot of that has been invested in Regent Park. We see this shiny building, it looks very nice, and, and you know, we're happy and, and, and proud of that. But we need to now invest in the, the social side of, of revitalization, and that is creating more opportunities for youth. It's creating more safe spaces, as Salem is doing um, with, with, through with Paintbox. And it's also creating legacies. We need positive legacies in Regent Park. We don't need to remember all the negative that took place in the last 30, 40 years in Regent Park. Let's create legacies, let's create memories, let's create a community that can come together, um, the old, the young, and through sport. And we know that you know, creating sports teams will also create employment. It'll create mentorship. And um, it's, it's gonna be a, it's, it's a win-win for, for the whole community overall. So, so just to break it down, the investments in the brick and the mortar and the physical buildings in Regent, uh, that was largely done with Daniels Corp as well as TCHC um, and, and the city and, and probably some orders of government all coming together. And that was millions of dollars invested in buildings. Yes. Is that correct? And with the social development plan, um, that is an investment in people. So it's about programs, it's yes. about jobs development, mm -hmm. it's about skill development, it's about pathways to education and out of poverty and into 
to uh, hopefully prosperity. Is that correct? Definitely. And, and sorry, go ahead. Sorry. And I mean, you know, we all, I mean, we, we, have, we know the price tag of what it's taken and what it will take to, you know, to finish the revitalization of Regent Park. And we don't need that much. You know, we don't need millions and millions of dollars to build these programs that will be, you know, everlasting for these youth and that will, you know, build outcomes for them right away. This, I mean, these outcomes that we're looking at, it's, it, the, the, we want them to last long, just as the, you know, the SWIM program that we, we that you know, was developed and 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 um, you know, endorsed by, you know, by the you councillors uh, for Regent Park, which is wonderful, and we totally appreciate that. And some of these children here actually are in that SWIM program and are able to, you know, to to use that pool in Regent Park and learn how to swim. But it's important to to create more avenues for them and permanent avenues and avenues that not only involves the youth, but I remember I, I spoke to some of the, the the new the new tenants in Regent Park who are seniors, and they talked about oh I'll bake some muffins for for that football game you know we'll we'll be out there cheering, and when I heard these you know these older people say that, to me I'm looking at that's going to bring you know the new faces of Regent Park and the old and bring the young together and you know I feel that sport is something that can bring bring together everyone regardless of of you know of religion race sexual orientation sport is something that brings together communities on a whole Thank you. And because the Regent Park revitalization, um, I, I think, formally began um, in 2007, it's, mm -hmm. it's a long time ago. It's now been 13 years of, of, of investing in, in, the, in the assets, the physical assets, the roads, the, the, the buildings, the aquatic center, the sports field. Um, and at this juncture in time, we have an opportunity at the City of Toronto to actually fund the social development plan, which is about $635,000 compared to the millions that have already been invested. Um, it's 13 years later, and we are now just talking about investing in people. Yes. yes. It, would you say it's a little bit late? Definitely. It's definitely late. I mean, I think it's probably 30 years too late. You know, let, let's not, you know, bring revitalization into the picture. I mean, for Regent Park, it's, you know, it's, it's 30 years too late. Um, a lot of lives lost. But I think that we are, you know, at a point in time where we realize that it counts to invest in people. We've done the infrastructure part of Regent Park. And, you know, you know, who lives in Regent Park is, is grateful and glad for that. But now we need to look at the people. We need to look at the young people who are, who are behind me, who want a future, who want to be able to live and not have to, you know, think about not living to see 15, not living to see 16. We need to look at these youth who they want to live, they want to go to university, they want to go to college, they want to play sports, they want to represent their country, they want to be, they want to live. Yeah. And the only way to do that is to invest in them. We have to invest in these youth, they are our future, and they are what counts. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. Let's just be really brief. A lot of commitments were made to the Regent Park community when the redevelopment, revitalization started. Uh, do you recall when the commitment was made to make investments like these into the Regent community? Was that done, it could have been as much as a decade ago, I'd imagine. I just, I, I don't, I'm not even sure I was around as a city councillor when those early commitments were made. Do you know when the commitment was made by the city to undertake this sort of social development plan and bring bring some social investment in the region? Um, I think it was um, during the, the start of revitalization, and it was a so, sort of an ongoing commitment. But um, it wasn't until, you know, quite recently that, you know, with the, the, um, the, so, the social development plan being kind of rolled out, that you know that the talk has been um, well the, the action that the talk has been there but now it's time to, to move to action um, and it's been it's been slow definitely I mean we've seen a lot change in Regent Park with regards to the the, the, the phase of Regent Park but we haven't seen much 
change with regards to to the people and to making the lives better, you know, lives better for, especially for our, our, our young people. Unfortunately, um, you know, over the last 10 years, there's been so much lives lost. Um, three at 15 years old, um, Celan White, uh, he was 15 years old. Uh, two years later, Tyson Bailey, who went to Central Tech, who was a football player, who was already looking to be scouted to universities in the States. Um, he was gone at 15 in the same building as, as Celan White. Uh, and then a year and a half ago, uh, you know, Makai, who lost his life a day after turning 15. And, you know, the reality is we have all these, you know, beautiful infrastructure in Regent Park, which these children are really grateful for. I know they are. Um, but the underlying disparity of gangs and gun violence still exists. And my goal is to have none of these children behind me ever have the thought of wanting to pick up a gun or the need to pick up a gun and to kill someone or to rob or to sell drugs. That's what I'm starting. This is why I bring these children down here so that you guys could see their faces and get to know them and see them on the street and come to their football games, come to their soccer games, come to their basketball games and cheer them on and let them know that there is hope for them. They don't have to turn to gangs. They don't have to turn to gangs. They can actually live a life and become a teenager and become an adult and choose to own their home, maybe in Regent Park, you know, be employed there, be social workers, be youth mentors, you know, be doctors, lawyers, and psychologists. They have that, they have that. That's their, that's actually their given right as being a Canadian citizen. They have that right. We need to allot them that. We, um, when we go through our budget, we have these categories of funded priorities and then ones that might be in the plan but are end up in the non-funded category. And I think oftentimes maybe we lose sight of what the impacts are when someone so click, quickly clicks that mouse to move it into the unfunded category. Yes. Um, but it's moments like these that I think we're reminded of why having public deputations and the opportunity for these strong young voices to come out and speak their mind and remind us about why we're here. I think that this just demonstrates how important this type of forum is uh, to us getting our priorities, our priorities right. So thank you all so much for coming out and reminding us. Thank you. Thank you, and I want to thank you too. And congratulations for all of you coming out and speaking so well to us. That's great. Thank you. We generally don't have uh, clapping, but I will honor that 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 applause for that. So, no, don't think they're going to be accepting clapping all day. But I do want to thank everyone for coming. Um, we do have uh, Ellen Goulden, who uh, was the third up on the list. She is now here. So I'll ask her to come up. And after that will be Heather Marshall, Alberta Noakes, and Joanne Warner. Thank Welcome. You. You'll have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Councillors. Um, my name is Elaine Golden. I am here on behalf of the Anglican Diocese of Toronto. And um, beyond our parishes, the Anglican Church in Toronto serves thousands of marginalized Torontonians through out-of-the-cold programs, drop-ins, community meals, refugee sponsorship, support for newcomers, and other programs. So the challenges that I'm talking about today are not abstract issues to us. They are re very real obstacles to beloved members of our communities. For years, we've been writing letters and we've been coming to this committee urging the city to raise property taxes and explore other revenue tools to address the ongoing challenges we're facing in the areas of housing, transit, and other city services that reduce poverty and build equity among Toronto's diverse population, such as the programs um, highlighted by the previous deputation. We note that adjusted for both inflation and population growth, that City of Toronto spending per capita has actually decreased over the past decade. So we're not keeping pace with the population that we have. And we welcome the announcement. We sent a letter uh, to the mayor, and I think all of you received it, uh, that the mayor and council are prepared to raise property taxes above the rate of inflation in the next budget through the city building fund. This is a significant step in the right direction, and I want to applaud you for taking that leadership. 
but we think even more can and must be done through introduction of additional revenue tools, such as a vacancy tax, uh, raising the um, municipal uh, land transfer tax on luxury homes and reintroducing the vehicle registration tax. First of all, housing. Housing is one of our top priorities. It is deeply unaffordable in this city and it is deeply inequitable. Rents have risen far higher than inflation or wages for and incomes for the lower, lowest um, income members of our city. Almost half of tenants are paying over 30% of their income on shelter, which puts them in core housing need, and 23% are paying over 50% of their income on shelter. Social housing waitlist has grown by over 50%, with now more than 110,000 households on the list. That's a small town, people waiting for social housing. And the number of people waiting for supportive housing has more than tripled in the last decade. And yet, in that time, only 4,000 affordable rental units have been completed. So we're barely making a drop in the bucket. Not surprisingly, the number of homeless people has skyrocketed. We have between 8,000 and 9,000 people homeless now, as opposed to 5,000 a decade ago. And the number of people in family shelters has tripled. Homelessness kills. Every month, outside our parish of the Holy Trinity, we gather to remember the people who have died while homeless in this city. Last week, we marked the 1,000th name. My colleague, the Reverend Allison Falby, who is the uh, priest and director of All Saints Church and Community Centre, spoke feelingly of two of her parishioners who had died homeless in the last month. One of them was a 68-year-old woman who had only been homeless in the last three months. We cannot allow this to go on. We recognize that some progress has been made and there have been plans through Housing Now and Housing TO, uh, but we have concerns about the depth and length of affordability that are created through those programs. When you're talking about affordable being 80% of average market rent, that is still deeply unaffordable for most people. When you're saying that affordability is guaranteed for 15 or 20 or 25 years, that's just pushing the problems down the road. What we need to do, what the city needs to do, is in prioritize nonprofit and cooperative housing providers who will guarantee deep affordability and who will guarantee perpetual affordability for affordable housing. As for childcare, something that is uh, that is on my mind today as my children are, are home um, during this strike. Despite increases in both the number of spaces and the number of subsidies available, Toronto's childcare continues to be the most expensive in Canada, and that's if you can even get a space. In seven of our city wards, childcare spaces are available for fewer than a third of the young children there. I have to wrap up, please. Yep, and they are wards which have some of the highest rates of child poverty in Canada. Finally, we, we support uh, the recommendations contained in the Social Planning of Toronto's uh, report, which includes a vacancy tax and a, a tax on the houses over um, $2 million, an increased tax on houses over $2 million, and that money should go back into affordable thank, housing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for being here. So, in for my clarity, are you speaking on behalf of the Anglican Diocese today? Yes. Is that correct? That's All right. Correct. And, and for those of us um, not as attuned as we should with <laughs> denominations within Christianity, the, the Anglican Diocese represents whom within the city? Um, it represents the Anglican parishes uh, within the city and beyond the city. We have about 200 parishes, but they're not all in the city of Toronto. Okay. We, we How many Anglican parishes are there in the city of Toronto? There about over a hundred, but over I, 100. I, I don't know the exact figure yeah. right off my top. And, and just to be clear, on behalf of the Anglican Diocese, these hundred churches, you're calling on us to invest more to address housing affordability and child care. Specifically, calling, if I understood you correct, correctly, to implement a vacant homes tax, okay. a new rate within the municipal land and transfer tax for homes over three million, yes. and the reintroduction of the vehicle registration tax. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And for the vacant homes and the municipal land transfer tax, I heard you say that those, any money directed from that should go towards housing, is that? Yes. Okay. 
Uh, those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you. And very, thank you very much for your deputation. Next is Heather Marshall. Good morning. Um, my name is Heather Marshall, and I'm the campaign director for Toronto Environmental Alliance. My organization's over 30 years old, and we've been reviewing the budget every year. But this one's different. This is the first budget of a new decade, and it's also the first budget, city budget since you passed a climate emergency declaration and committed to accelerate the work that needs to be done to reach net zero by as early as 2040. And it's good to see some new money in this budget for climate action, as well as an increase in the number of staff who will be working on Transform TO and the climate emergency. But climate action spending in Toronto is still well below that of other cities, including our peers in Vancouver. We appear to be spending only about $7 per resident on climate action compared to $80 in Van. Why aren't we spending more? Climate change demands that we not only reduce our emissions fast, we must deeply invest in climate solutions that also meet urgent everyday community needs, like some of the ones you've already heard here, housing, transportation, jobs, and resilience to the kind of climate impacts we'll have. First on housing, even though there is money in the budget for building new affordable housing, we need much more. And we also cannot afford to lose any of our existing rental apartment buildings. The people who are on our wait lists, many are living in these buildings. And they're falling into disrepair, they're harming people's health, and they're wasting a lot of energy. Thanks to some of the City of Toronto's low interest loan programs like Help and High Rise, some of these buildings are being preserved, they're being retrofitted, and they're not downloading these costs onto the tenants. Demand for these programs is growing, but the loan fund is shrinking. With, on, with another two years left to go on this fund and only $5 million left, we won't get through enough re retrofits at this rate. So T is calling on Council to ramp up energy retrofits in 2020 by increasing capital funding for help and high-rise programs. On transportation, we want to note that expanding public transit, making service more affordable and reliable are key to attracting more riders. The delay in fully implementing the fair fare discount pass, the delay in the order of a lot of streetcars needed in the system, and the growing backlog of unfunded transit repairs are major concerns in this budget. It's also a concern that there's a $4 million gap in the capital funding to realize your green, fee green fleet ambitions to have 45% zero emission vehicles by 2030. T is calling on Council to invest more capital dollars into public transit and green fleet in this budget. And a point on jobs. Economic Development and Culture recently released a really interesting report on the green industry sector in Toronto. I don't know if you knew this, but the green sector is actually growing twice as fast as other sectors in our city. We appreciate that Councillor McKelvey recently asked for a staff budget briefing note on this about the breakdown of spending by sector, because we do believe that spending in the green industry se sector in Toronto is woefully inadequate. We're calling on Council to invest in Toronto's green industry sector in 2020 so that we can create local green jobs and Toronto-made climate solutions. A point on resilience. Climate resilience has social, economic, and environmental dimensions that we need to consider. While we've seen a welcome increase in staff positions for Environment and Energy Division this year, there's proposed reductions in staffing and funding in other div divisions like social development, children's services, public health, and there's large funding gaps for TC TTC and TCHC improvements. And this is deeply concerning. The disproportionate impacts climate change will have on vulnerable and equity-seeking communities in Toronto demands that these services must be enhanced, not maintained, and certainly not reduced. And we also know that our natural environment provides many services that we rely on to control flooding and deal with extreme heat. While we see some new funding for tree maintenance in the PFNR budget, we don't seem to see any new funding in 2020 to kickstart the ravine strategy and no real capital plan for enhancing resilience beyond paying for current and past storms that have damaged our city. We need to proactively invest far more in protecting, restoring, and expanding these natural spaces. We can't just wait for the next big storm to hit. And lastly, on financial tools, we are asking how are we paying for climate action? Because Toronto clearly needs more funding sources to do more. T supports Council's plan to increase the city building fund levy and dedicate that money to affordable housing and transit infrastructure. When built to the highest green standard, public transit and affordable housing can tackle climate change. 
but everyone needs to pay their fair share for climate action, not just residents, and much more money is needed. You'll have to so wrap up, please. Today, T is encouraging Council to put the wheels in motion for a commercial parking levy. We know that from the KPMG report, this could raise at least $170 million and be dedicated to public transit. When you pass the Climate Emergency Declaration, you committed to exploring all viable and equitable finance mechanisms to move on climate change in 2021. You can't do this without financial tools. A commercial levy on parking could fund public transit, Thank and you. a mansion tax could help fund affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Heather, for your deputation. With respect to the City of Toronto taking a historic move in declaring a climate emergency, uh, and you've been a budget observer for, for years, and so has T for decades now, um, do you see the, the, the policy shift um, necessary to follow suit with what we declared as an emergency? Do you think we've done uh, enough? Uh, certainly we haven't. I know there's some, some ideas that have been floated around in the Transform TO plan, uh, policies that would, for instance, kickstart a lot more retrofits in our city. If retrofits were required to be part of meeting the building code, uh, to make sure people were living in healthy buildings that could keep them cool, keep them warm, and significantly reduce climate emissions, we would be in a much better place. Right now we have a small voluntary f uh, funding program, and that's it. Uh, so that's just one example. So how do you think how do you think city council and the city of Toronto should should reconcile those differences on one hand we, we made a bold statement and we stood up and we said hey headlines look at us we declare an emergency mm -hmm. this is uh, is obviously a topic of imminent importance and at the same time we still leave these equal um, uh, initiatives uh, as, uh, as, as voluntary. Um, they're, they're suggestions, if anything, more than anything else. Like, um, what needs to happen here with our thinking, with, with how we design our budget, in order for us to really live up to the declaration of, a, of the emergency here? Well, we, we know that there's some outcomes in this budget that focus on, you know, how many more homes are going to be built? How many more jobs are we going to create? We don't really have anything clear in this budget that reports on how many emissions are we going to reduce, how many good green jobs are we going to be create, creating, and how are we going to leverage any spending we, may, we put in on housing and transportation or on businesses, how are we going to leverage that money to actually achieve climate action as well as uh, poverty reduction and more equity in our city. So I think we definitely need to step up on some investments. We need to... Um, definitely step up on the staffing and as you know as the folks from Regent Park were mentioning sometimes you just need to invest more in people and it's not only staff that need to be invested in but out in the communities we don't even know if there's a neighborhood improvement grant for climate action this year in the in the social development budget and last year was a huge success so even these small amounts of money that can kickstart a lot of community initiatives on climate change we don't see it in the budget. There's no really clear climate budget in front of us right now. In, in other cities where they have also, I mean, this has been a movement or afoot, right? So internationally, we're seeing uh, other cities, other states and, and provinces also take um, charge of declaring the, the emergency and trying to tackle climate change. Um, what are they doing differently to ensure that they get the outcomes that they're looking for than what we are doing? Because it sounds to me we've made the declaration, but you know the suggestions is that we haven't implemented enough to get us to the distance of, of those goals. Mm -hmm. what, what are we doing wrong? Um, I think it's a combination of we're, we're behind. We're significantly behind. We've had many years <clears throat> at Toronto City Council where we actually were going retrograde and peeling back environmental services, peeling back community services in ways that hindered our action on climate change. Now we're trying to catch up with all our other peer cities. Um, so clearly we need to be investing more, and that's a huge part. But being really clever about where we're investing that money, and also making sure, frankly, that the private sector, the financial sector, is paying their fair share so that we're not asking residents to be the only ones in our city financing climate action in Toronto. We're not the only ones producing pollution. We're not the only ones with responsibility. And so we do need to be holding the, the large polluters more accountable for the carbon emissions they're putting into our city and the air pollution that they're contributing to. And I would say, even in an example like Vancouver, there, and I think the, um, the recent economic development report on the green industries highlights this. 
but they're investing perhaps 10 times as much as we are in their green sector. So no wonder they're further ahead. Um, they're not continuing to provide massive incentives for polluting industries in their community. They're actually putting those incentives towards growing their their green, clean sectors. And then finally, with respect to the commercial parking levy uh, and the yield of $176 million, um, if the City of Toronto chose to implement that as a new uh, form of revenue, um, do we need to ask the province for that permission or do we have it all built in here? My understanding from the KPMG report is that the that's a tool we already have uh, ability to put in place under um, the City of Toronto Act. We just That's why it's it. an exciting one to do. The money was already invested in uh, a K large KPMG report to find out what kinds of tools the city had power over, and this was one of them. And gra granted, parking levies could be across many industries, but a commercial parking levy would at least cover off a lot of the free parking that's being charged, uh, that's not being charged by, for instance, shopping malls. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, just on the, the capital plan for and, and resilience, you had mentioned, uh, and this, I had a question about this mm. last week, but I didn't, uh, I didn't have an opportunity to ask it, uh, about how much money was being invested into resilience compared to how much we're funding for storms we have to now fix infrastructure from. Can you... Can you get into that a little bit more? Yeah, sure. The, um, I mean, you have to also realize for an environmental group looking at the budget, we can only understand what we can see. Um, and sometimes we're left with a lot of questions in the budget that just don't clearly outline what we're doing on climate change and what we're not doing. But based on what we piece together, there was a, a capital spend for in the next 10 years on enhanced resiliency. But when we looked at what enhanced resiliency was defined by, it was all money that added up for past storms. Like, we're still paying for damages from 2017, 2018, and 2019 storms in Toronto, and all the enhanced resiliency money seemed to be going towards just damages from those past storms. That doesn't leave us with any money, uh, it seems, in the budget to actually get more prepared for climate change and proactively invest in our green spaces and even build out more green infrastructure so we can be more ready. Thank you. Thank you and thank you for your deputation. You're welcome. Next is Alberta Noakes <clears throat> and after that will be Joanne Warner then Michael Rosenberg. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. On August 25th last year below my apartment a homeless woman was screaming for her life. I called the police, who were already receiving multiple calls about this incident. Her cries got worse and worse and continued for more than 20 minutes. Uh, this continued three or four times a week, generally between 2 and 5 a.m., from August to the beginning of December. The screaming was so loud, it was waking us up through closed windows. To be woken from a deep sleep by the screams of someone begging to be saved from death so frequently is not something that you ever forget. To clear the encampments in the Rosedale Valley where this woman was living, Toronto has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in police, fire, sanitation, EMS, parks and other city services and the time of councillors, the mayor and their assistants. This money seems to have been wasted. The encampments have been in the valley for many years. They're cleared and then they're reestablished because the city has, no, has taken inadequate long-term steps to address the interrelated crises of homelessness, addiction, mental health and poverty that drive people with nowhere else to go to live under bridges, in ravines, bus shelters and on cardboard on our sidewalks. Could this money and time have been much better spent on long-term initiatives like shelter beds and affordable housing? The Mayor's office and Councillor Layton's responses to my emails about these crises is that they're complex and not easy to fix, and that's certainly true. The city blames the province, the province blames the feds, and the city says that it's adding shelter beds. But this is nowhere near enough. More and more Torontonians with nowhere to live are dying outside. The measure of all of us is how well we treat the most vulnerable among us. 
We're one of the richest cities in the world, one of the best educated. As President Obama once said, perhaps it's time to stop <clears throat> looking at the complexity of the problem and start fixing it. Perhaps we could start with better organization better and better use of the money and resources that we have. The emails about the Rosedale Valley encampments that I sent to Councillor Layton's office were copied to 27 people. That kind of decentralization is generally costly and ineffective. I've asked several times and am yet to receive an answer. Who is leading our efforts to deal with homelessness? Someone with the experience and clout to coordinate efforts make and make better use of resources to get things done. I have to say that everybody who I emailed and spoke to at the city about this was very helpful. But there's just no one, it seems, that you can go to to, under, to understand the full, who, who has a picture of everything that's going on. It, it feels very disorganized. Money comes from many budgets to deal with the crisis of homelessness, mental health, addiction, and poverty on an emergency basis. What would it save in the long run to house people rather than continually respond to their increasing emergency needs? The city, has the city quantified what we're spending annually to provide services to the homeless? What could be done if that money was centralized? What, what could better coordination save us? The city and developers have sites that are awaiting development and derelict buildings. The innovative stacked market was created in shipping containers on unused city land. We need medium and long-term solutions to homelessness. If we could get bylaw and land use adjustments for a retail development, why can't we do the same or better for the homeless? With a leader who can get things done, we would be better able to innovate and problem solve to draw on the expertise of developers, architects, planners, urban visionaries, homeless advocates, social workers, police, and other services, so that people wouldn't feel that they were just being brought onto a committee to be on a committee and to have nothing come of their efforts. I've worked for the City of Toronto, running the campaign that saved the music building at Exhibition Place in the 1980s, and I'm certainly not saying that any of this is simple. You'll have to wrap up, please. Yes. So all I'm really saying is thank you, and I hope you just remember the depth of this crisis in your deliberations, and I'm sure you will. Thanks again. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. I'm sorry, Councillor Wong Tam. Yeah, no, thank you very much, um, um, Ms. Noke. Um, your deputation is, uh, I think, very compelling. There are a number of complex situations here, all, all coming together in the Rosedale Ravines. Um, and just in Campmans everywhere, I think we're, we're seeing it on city streets, we're seeing it in, in the parks. Um, with respect to your suggestion about one person being in charge, or perhaps one entity being in charge. Yes. Um, I have experienced this frustration myself of trying to, to, to plug in all the, the service gaps. How do, we, yes. how do we keep that person from falling further and further into the margins? Um, what, what is your suggestion, if, if you don't mind me, if I, if I sure. may just ask? What, what it would seem is if, that there, if there are 27 people on any email about any situation going on in the encampments, it would seem that it's a... There's a level of decentralization that requires somebody. With that amount of decentralization, you have no responsibility because it's easy for people to go, oh, well, that's so and so, or this should go over to whoever. And it's a, there's an assumption that someone else will be doing that thing. So, one agency with a, a, a leader who has experience inside the city and understanding how, how to pull all of these pieces together. It would seem to me that uh, a, an agency devoted to solving this crisis within the city of Toronto with, a, with an effective leader would be a place to start. And also, again, looking at how much we're spending to, to do continual emergency fixes on this. I mean, anybody who has a house or a property knows that if you maintain it and look after things for the long term, rather than constantly having to deal with, oh no, the roof is blown off, the basement's leaking, if you're constantly dealing with emergency fixes, you're always focused on that instant. It's too hard to focus on a bigger picture and look long term. So I think centralization, one agency within the city, 
with enough clout and a bit of money to be able to do something and to make use of the resources we have. I don't even know whether how much more money we're, we're saying we need to ask for because I, I just don't know if it's been quantified and, and if we've looked at it in a different way, a way to reframe the problem, if you will. If we were to create this um, sort of specialized body using perhaps the existing city resources where we streamline the, the decision making as well as the, the, the service reach, um, because I, I do think that we have transportation right of way that manages the, the sidewalks. Then right. we have the parks uh, staff who manage the, the parks. Then we've got right. the ravine folks who deal with the ravines. And, and, and yeah. then there's the bylaw officers that overlap all of this. And right. so if we were to put together a, a, a sort of a command center that specifically yeah. dealt with this, and this is what they do during the, the, the peak winter months, and their priority is, or their, sorry, their, their job is to make sure that everyone who's on the street is, is off the street and into some form of suitable shelter or housing accommodations, and that's their only objective. Is, is that a good use of the city's time and, and energy? To me, yes, that would seem to be so. And in fact, I mean, that deals with a short-term fix, but I think longer term, you need that same kind of agency to be looking beyond the, uh, beyond the immediate and emergency need in the winter of moving people off the streets and to look longer term at how do we, how do we keep people uh, from getting into a situation where it's costing us so much to help them in, uh, as emergency bits and pieces. Do you know if there's a city um, elsewhere that actually does this very well? Uh, I don't actually, and that's a good question. I would, I mean, if there, you know, and that's the other thing. If there, right now, it doesn't feel like there's a, a way for the city to pull people together who have, uh, or the organizational ability who have the full experience of people like Daniels. I don't know. This may already be happening, but it certainly doesn't seem to be. I I've asked if there's a, a group I can join or whatever to, to focus on these organizational questions. And I, again, I know that people are very busy, but I certainly haven't had an answer on that, and I would be happy to focus on it. It's the kind of work I did professionally. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Next is Joanne Warner. Joanne Warner. Next will be Michael Rosenberg. <coughs> Welcome, Michael. You'll have 15 minutes, or 15, five minutes. Okay, I'm Michael Rosenberg. Um, so this year we have uh, a, a, a slightly higher uh, increase in property taxes, but we still find that there just generally isn't the ability to do everything we want, especially in uh, housing, um, environment, um, transit. Um, and so we really have to see how we can get additional ways to make sure that those areas get enough money. And that means being able to actually make use of this outcomes-based budgeting process. To, I don't think that doing it in the way they have where they're looking at the, the previous year's actuals rather than approved actually gets us towards doing that kind of a review. We still don't have a process by which we can look at outcomes and compare outcomes and see whether we're spending money in the way that gets the greatest outcomes. We always go through a budget that is still based too much on the previous year's spending. So let's look at how we can make use of this new idea of an outcomes-based budget to actually compare and decide whether the money is being spent in the way that produces the best outcomes. We need to get to a process where we can recognize that technology spending is inefficient and actually reduces productivity. We need to be able to recognize that some of our spending, while it might seem to serve a useful purpose, does not actually 
serve as useful a purpose as the same amount of money spent in areas where we know we can get greater benefits, such as housing and transit. We know that the benefits of money spent there is going to be greater than the benefits of the same amount of money spent on technology or the same amount of money spent on security or other matters that are not as beneficial. And if we can use the outcomes-based budget approach to actually be able to make those decisions about outcomes, that is, would we be better off spending the same amount of money on one thing rather than another? This is not about efficiencies. It's not about doing the same things more efficiently. It's about deciding whether doing one thing is more outcomes-oriented and better use of money than doing the same amount of money on something else. And if you decide that the same amount of money spent on housing generates more benefit to the city than the same amount of money spent on security, then we can shift a little bit of money from one to the other. We also have to recognize the context, especially with regard to technology and the economy. It's not just that technology doesn't provide the benefits that people think it will, and it ends up costing a lot more than, than people think it will. So you end up further behind rather than further ahead. It's that that's going on throughout the entire economy, and it's shrinking the size of the economy and making it harder to even generate tax revenue without hurting people too much. So we really have to change the whole philosophy and recognize that we shouldn't be promoting technology. And when, when you know, it's really coming to a head now because some of the new technologies are reaching the point where they're, they're actually available for use now. And that is putting an extreme amount of pressure to do some really harmful and, and negative things that will distort the economy, reduce a people's welfare and, and put too much control in the, hand, in the hands of automated systems that we really don't have control over. So we really shouldn't be enthusiastic when those things are presented to us as options. We should be very, very critical and we should recognize that we can benefit more if the money is spent on lower tech things and especially the housing and transit areas. And I just want to give a couple of well, specific examples. I, I do support the, the Regent Park groups. I've been working with a lot of those uh, groups recently, so I support we'll that as a good Michael. use of money. And in terms of transit, I would support uh, more buses. Please make sure that that money does go, avail go there and that you are making choices in how you spend, not just leaving it to efficiencies or hoping for revenue. Thank, Thank you, Michael. You. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you very much for the deputation. Uh, next is Jasmine Ramsey Rizé. Welcome. You'll have five minutes. Good morning. My name is Jasmine Ramsey Rizé, and I'm the manager of advocacy at YWC Toronto, which is the city's largest multi service women's organization. YWC Toronto serves over 13,000 women, girls, trans, and non-binary individuals every year from Etobicoke to Scarborough. We focus on the economic empowerment of women through employment and training services, support the safety of women through affordable housing and emergency and emergency shelter programs, cultivate the leadership potential of girls, and offer supportive programs for women who have experienced violence. We also engage in systemic advocacy to create a just and equitable city for all residents. As you may know, we are a strong partner of the City of Toronto, particularly in providing housing and shelter for women and their families. We are encouraged by the City's housing strategy for the next 10 years, the Housing TO 2020-2030 Action Plan, and the City's commitment to increase our affordable and deeply affordable housing stock, including the 10,000 new affordable rental and supportive homes slated for women and girls. In terms of Budget 2020, we are also encouraged by the move to increase property taxes beyond the rate of inflation in 2020 and over the next six years. We have repeatedly advocated for the adoption of new revenue tools, so we see this development as a step in the right direction. However, we implore you to take bolder action because the gap between the rich and the poor in our city, which is increasingly taking on gendered, racial, and neighborhood dimensions, is rapidly expanding. 
Steps are not enough. We need leaps. As a recent report by Social Planning Toronto points out, a decade of austerity has disproportionately impacted equity-seeking communities. More than 17,000 children are waiting for a subsidized childcare spot, and Toronto continues to have the most expensive infant and preschool fees in Canada. More than one in five tenant households are paying 50% or more of their income on rent, leaving many one paycheck away from homelessness. The social housing wait list has grown by more than 50% and stands at more than 110 households today. And the use of family shelters has more than tripled. Because women are concentrated in lower paying jobs and tend to be the primary caregivers of their families, women and children are disproportionately impacted by these inequities. It is the poverty of women that is behind the poverty of so many children in our city. Life for black, indigenous, racialized and newcomer women, women with disabilities and senior women is harder than ever before. So business as usual is simply not sufficient. We urge you to critically examine your budget priorities and strategies, have tough conversations, and come up with principled solutions because right now the city is failing to protect its most vulnerable residents. For example, the 10% fare increase included in the Toronto Transit Commission's operating budget will increase financial barriers to public transit for low-income communities. Fares have risen roughly 42% over the last 10 years, approximately three times the rate of inflation, contributing an additional $295 million more each year to the city's budget. But this burden is borne by working class communities and women who disproportionately rely on public transit to get their children to school and to get to work. This is not a long-term solution to the Transit Commission's operating budget shortfall. Instead, like a few other um, uh, deputants before us, we urge you to explore other potential sources of city revenue, such as an alcohol beverage tax, a commercial parking levy, a vacant home tax, the reintroduction of the vehicle registration tax, and or increasing the municipal land transfer tax for luxury homes. Again, analysis conducted by KPMG, SBT, and other economists suggest these types of public benefit taxes could produce hundreds of millions of revenue dollars for the city. The demand for public service is rising and investment has not kept up, so cracks will continue to widen unless drastic action is taken. This requires courage and determination on your part to do the right thing. We are encouraged by the creation of a new gender equity unit at the city, but concerned about the monumental task this unit faces in implementing an intersectional gender equity strategy with the resources it has been allo allotted. And we want to ensure that adequate funds are in the budget for community consultations. We hope you will continue equity responsive budgeting and particularly integrate gender responsive budgeting in the context of the ongoing budget modernization project. You'll have to wrap up, please. Yes. As mentioned in the city's equity notes, strong equity impact analysis can support evidence-based decision making and optimize the use of city resources to achieve council approved equity priorities. So. Uh, we are, in conclusion, we are facing considerable and growing challenges. YDFC Toronto urges you to listen to the concerns of residents and community groups today and tomorrow and to critically evaluate your budget allocations and priorities with equity considerations in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Councilor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the deputation. Uh, Jasmine, in many of the briefing notes that were provided by the different divisions, mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes there was, um, a, a, I mean, every, every single port, there's a, there's a section that talks about uh, equity impacts and mm -hmm. the notes <coughs> specifically around that. Is this surprising to you that um, in, in the majority of the budget notes um, that the staff have concluded that there was zero equity impacts to all their spending in the division? Yes, that is surprising because the need is growing and the challenges facing our city are very um, high. And so, I mean, I think that what we need to see is a positive outcomes um, in terms of service level spending. And so for there to just be simply, again, have the same kind of service levels is, is not sufficient. Yeah. And when they say that there's zero equity impacts to the budgetary spending, in, in a nutshell, they're saying that these services, these programs that, they're being, that are being designed and, and, and operationalized, that they reach every single Torontonian equally. 
doesn't matter of the gender, their sexual orientation, mm. their race, their class. There's no, there's no equity impact. Everybody gets it, mm. these services. Um, do you believe that everybody in the city of Toronto uh, is accessing the city services equitably? Uh, absolutely not. And I think it'll be clear from the deputations today and tomorrow that that's simply not the case. So I'm not sure how the service level changes are being um, calculated the, in terms of the equity impacts, and I'm not sure what formula or al algorithm is being used, but perhaps that should be re-evaluated um, or re-examined. Okay. Because what, what we're seeing in the programs, we have more than 30 programs across 11 communities across the city. We're seeing a growth in poverty. We're seeing an increase in inequities, and we're seeing it take on racialized gender dimensions. And so I don't think that access to city services is equitable, and I don't think that the allocations are being really viewed through an equity lens. It's not reaching the target populations in the way that it should. So based on the, the services that you're providing and the demand for services that you're seeing uh, you know, exponentially increase, it sounds like you know, mm -hmm. three times what it was is, is definitely a, a big jump. But when staff here internally, senior staff put forward a note, given their expert advice to mm -hmm. this committee and to the executive and ultimately to city council that everything is, is okay, which is why they say that there's no equity impacts, Right. That is not the experience that you're experiencing on the ground. Is that the same with anyone else who's providing service in the social sector, who are trying to get access to um, uh, transit, who's trying to get access to housing, to childcare? Uh, because the staff are saying here, everything is fine. That's why there's no equity impacts. Mm -hmm. Well, all we can comment on is what we're seeing in the communities we serve, and we're seeing an increase in demand, an increase in demand in terms of housing, in terms of shelter, we um, have a 99% occupancy rate for our uh, violence against women shelters. It is a real and pressing issue. And um, you know, women's homelessness is invisible homelessness. It is growing in our city and we have to do more to address it. So I can't comment on, again, the algorithms that are being used, the motivations I'm sure are well-intentioned, but there must be a better way of examining and evaluating these things and the impacts. And more and fulsome way. Thank you very much. That's helpful. And then with respect to the poverty reduction strategy that the city had uh, originally mm -hmm. adopted and now seems to have largely evaporated mm -hmm. from my observations mm -hmm. from the, the budget, um, how do we track outcomes and investments if we don't see it in the, 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 the budget? Mm -hmm. how, I mean, that's an excellent question. And in fact, there was a sentence in my deputation that I couldn't, um, con couldn't share because of the time uh, restrictions, but essentially a strategy is only as good as its budget. And so it's great for the city to indicate their awareness and willingness to address an issue, but then when it comes to budget time, to finesse the numbers and not allocate the proper resources to really implement the strategy to its full extent. So with poverty reduction, we know that the strategy has failed. Poverty is increasing. So inequities are increasing. Uh, inequality is increasing in our city. So we are doing a lot. The um, city is trying its best, I believe, and the issues are complex. However, more can be done. Thank you. And, and I think we need a little bit more um, bolder action. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next is Elizabeth Nyberg, and after that will be Emily Johnson. Yes. <laughs> We're just a gaggle of grannies urging you up off your fannies. Homelessness is a fright. Housing must be our right. Act boldly now. Inclusionary zoning, deep affordability, stopping rent evictions, it's all good public policy. Housing's a basic, a basic necessity, necessity, not just another commodity. commodity. Other cities have willed to solve this great ill. Ill. Toronto, Toronto can, can do, do it, it too. too. This one's even easier. 
Universal design. design. Why do they whine? What is the scoop? Put us in the loop. We all need housing that's barrier free. One day you'll be old just like me. Barrier free housing is a human right. We demand it now. We demand it now. Stamp. Okay. Uh, How many nights must a child go to bed without being properly fed? In, In this rich province, how many must die before politicians see red? The answer, of course, must be in our heart. There's plenty of food for us all. How many nights must some sleep in the streets in winter so bitterly cold? How many more must die on our streets before we're another year old? The answer must be to find housing now for all those left out in the cold. How many families are waiting for homes, their children with no place to play? How can they live in cramped, crowded rooms? No money to live day by day. The answer must be affordable homes for families in need right away. Now, do you want to do that? From down the street, I hear their voices calling me. The young and old, all homeless and alone. They plead for food, for coffee and for money. But most of all, they're longing for a home. So sing out loud in chorus for the homeless here. And sing out loud for justice and for peace. Together we can make Tio a better place. Keep singing loud and long for those who cannot speak. We've grown tired of all the politicians. They talk the talk but never walk out here. It's time they spent a night out in the biting cold, for maybe then they'd really start to hear. So sing out loud in chorus for the homeless here, and sing out loud for justice and for peace. Together we can make Tio a better place. Keep singing loud and long for those who cannot speak. Storms keep brewing. What? Let's start again. Are we doing it? Prayer shock. Okay. Prayer shock. Storms keep brewing. What are we doing about climate change? About climate change. No time for disbelievers or gasoline SUVers. We must act. We must act. While we're analyzing, the temperatures are rising, fires will increase, food production cease. We watch the deserts growing, starvation never slowing. We must act, we must act. Glaciers are shrinking, islands are sinking. As oceans rise before our very eyes, no time for leaky houses now. We hope it's not too late now. We must act. We must act. Thank you. No questions, right? Yeah, I guess they deserve a clap too. Thank you. Next is, uh, where are we here? Emily Johnson. 
is a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, well, it morning, always counselors. is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good morning, councillors. Um, as has previously been touched upon, uh, on January 7th, Social Planning Toronto released its report, Toronto After a Decade of Austerity, The Good, the Bad and the Ugly. The story it tells is one of continued failure to adequately invest in Toronto's social needs. It tells the story of a city stuck on a treadmill, struggling to keep up as that lack of investment leads to greater and more emergent needs like the current housing crisis. Mayor Tory's reluctance to champion new revenue streams has kept us on that treadmill. Average monthly rent for a one-bedroom has gone from around $1,270 in October 2018 and around $1,490 for a two-bedroom to average asking rents in December 2019 of $2,300 for a one-bedroom and $3,000 for a two-bedroom. I have many friends who are leaving the city because they can't afford to live here and because they certainly can't afford to raise a family here. Staying in my apartment after recently separating from my husband, my rent is now close to 50% of my monthly income. It's frustrating that two years ago I would have been able to downsize to a more affordable bachelor, but today there are no more affordable options. I can only imagine how difficult it would be for someone with dependents. And of course, this is to say nothing of those families and individuals who are the most vulnerable in our city. When the city building levy was announced in 2015, it was already insufficient to address transit and housing projects in a substantive way. In the years since then, the mayor should have recognized the trends of declining rental housing availability and rising shelter use. Uh, should have looked at the list of households waiting for social housing growing by thousands and begun to champion new revenue tools with a sense of urgency. While the announced increase to the city building levy is an excellent move, it is exactly the kind of decision which should have been made years ago. Now, in the midst of a full-blown housing and homelessness crisis, more is needed. When the $60 vehicle registration tax was axed in 2011, Mayor Ford said at the time that it was putting $64 million back in the pockets of Torontonians. But the data assembled by Social Planning Toronto proves just how much the loss of that revenue has cost us all. In 2016, a report to Council estimated that a reintroduced vehicle registration tax between $20 and $100 annually could generate $18 to $94 million for the city each year. Yet just last year, the mayor was, and I quote, absolutely against reintroducing such a tax, and motions to reintroduce the tax repeatedly fail. With so few revenue tools available to the city, this is one that we simply cannot ignore. It is also impossible to ignore the mayor's lack of leadership on this front. Perhaps the mayor would consider championing another revenue stream, a vacant homes tax. It is appalling that every night more than 9,000 people are homeless in the city, while an estimated tens of thousands of units stand empty. I understand there's a city staff report due in February on potential design and benefits of the tax. I'm sure it will note that Vancouver has seen significant revenue generated by their own tax to the tune of $38 million in 2017. Changes to the municipal land transfer tax are also worth a closer look, though the mayor has previously been dismissive of the concept. Adding a new top tier to the MLTT, 3% for properties valued at $3 million or more, could raise an estimated $5.1 million annually. In the inequality capital of Canada, there's a strong argument to be made for a tax on the ultra-wealthy that would contribute to getting the most vulnerable residents off of waitlists for affordable and supportive housing. Even $5 million annually means a great deal to them. Again, I applaud Mayor Tory and Council for their fortitude in securing the increase to property taxes. Housing TO 2020 to 2030 is another great start, but only if it can develop, deliver on its targets. The fact that the city needs even more resources to get us off the treadmill and ahead of this crisis. The time for half measures is over. I would ask all sympathetic councillors to join councillors Wong Tam, Layton, Cressy, and Bailao in pushing the mayor and their more reluctant colleagues to adopt any one or all of these measures as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions, Councillor Layton? Just because it was brought up. <laughs> Um, and a somewhat rhetorical question. Do you know that the actual cost of the vehicle, vehicle registration fee to vehicle owners never changed? It didn't get cut in half. I didn't know that. What happened was the province then doubled theirs. So everyone paid the same amount, it's just someone else got the money. And you know what the deep irony is of all of this now? Premier Ford is collecting the city's vehicle registration tax. <laughs> How bonkers is that? Councillor, that's pretty bonkers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, Susan Crocker. I think there will be a substitution. I I realize I am not Susan Crocker. I am uh, here in her place. Unfortunately, she had to leave. Um, so I am Susan Wright with the Toronto Arts Council. Thank you very much, councillors, for uh, taking the time to hear me and everybody else today. And I note that those who have employed the arts in their speaking have actually um, 
captured the attention of the entire uh, group and have done really well by it. Um, thank you, councillors, for the work that you are doing to support increased arts funding. Throughout the years, we've been delighted to see so many of you out at count countless arts events and to hear you speak about the importance of the arts and your commitment to work with us in the sector. In this time of growth at home and instability around the world, it is essential that our vision for Toronto be both bold and inclusive. For this reason, Toronto Arts Council and Toronto Arts Foundation are enthusiastic partners of the city's year for public art in 2021. Indeed, there are few areas of city investment that are as effective in meeting all sides of the ledger of public benefit, economic development, community engagement, and improving the quality of life for our residents. The mayor has characterized a vibrant arts sector as a jobs magnet, recognizing that talented and innovative workforce needed to power our business sectors who can choose to live anywhere in the world are opting for Toronto because of our creative neighborhoods. Simultaneously, our artists and organizations create local programming that engage youth, reach into underserved com communities, and provide opportunities for meaningful participation. Last year, Toronto Arts Council adjudicated almost 2,500 applications and dispersed $18.8 .8 million in grants to 920 arts organizations and individual artists. With grants funds equivalent to just $6.70 per Torontonian, we are achieving impact. But it is not enough. For every individual artist that receives a TAC grant of $5,000 or $10,000, there are four others whose applications cannot be supported. And even more troublesome than precarious incomes are the exceptionally high costs for artists to live in our city. Toronto Arts, Council, uh, Toronto Arts Foundation recently published a new art stats booklet. It documents the extent to which Toronto's artists are struggling. We know Toronto has more artists than any other city in the country by quite a margin, but over half of them make less than $30,000 per year, well under the living wage for our city. Not only do they have disproportionately low incomes, they also face disproportionately high costs to live in Toronto. This is because most artists have to pay for workspace on top of the usual rent, and most continue paying for essential training throughout their careers. These realities have led as many as 73% of Toronto's artists to consider leaving the city. I know that you know that we cannot afford to lose our artists. So yes, we encourage Budget Committee to approve the staff recommended arts budget increase, including 500,000 to TAC, but please do not stop there. We urge the city to continue to work with us to reduce space costs for artists and nonprofit arts organizations. And any opportunity to increase arts funding would be welcome and well spent. Thank you. Councillor Lane. Yes, thank you. Just very quickly. So you're supportive of the $2 million increase? Overall, yes. Uh, overall. Um, it, do you know what breakdown of that is? It's 2.5 million. 0.5 of it is for the year of public art, but then some of the other 2 million is. Do you know what that breakdown is? Our understanding is 500,000 is, is being allocated to TAC, which is, um, and then um, there was, um, I had thought it might be a million for year of public art, but it, I, I'm, I'm not sure, sorry. Okay, okay we'll, figure, we'll figure that out, thanks. The Director of uh, Economic Development will be providing a briefing note on that for the wrap up. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Uh, next, Lucy Troisi, uh, and after that, Barbara Hall, a former mayor, and Susan Craig will be after that. Uh, so both Sus Lucy Troisi, a former councillor, and Barbara Hall are up together. So will you be doing a, a joint? Yes, we've all registered, Mr. Chair, so um, my time will just go a little bit over the five minutes, but the other two speakers are much less than their five. And just two, I know Barbara, of course. Um, and uh, Your name's on the... Ryan Dudnick, yes. Sorry, what was the name? Ryan Dudnick from Council Fire. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, you'll have... Uh, let's just start when you can.
Here we go. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for us to speak today on behalf of the Cabbage Town Youth Center. I'm joined by former Mayor Barbara Hall and Ryan Dudnick from Council Fire. I'll be rushing through this just to get through this presentation. Cabbage Town Youth Center was founded in 1972. It has been serving the Regent Park, St. Jamestown, Moss Park, and Cabbage Town communities for almost five decades. What started off as a boxing club uh, for high-risk youth, um, we, and during that time, we put through nine Olympians uh, through our boxing club. So we're not just known within the downtown or Toronto or Canada, we're actually worldwide known. Um, and several years later, uh, we've become a full-scale community centre. Uh, we have outgrown our location at 2 Lancaster Avenue, and uh, we utilize all the neighbouring schools uh, within that region. Uh, in addition, in the summer months, we expand our camp programs throughout the City of Toronto. Our vision and our mission, uh, our vision is to foster the St. James Town, Cabbage Town and Regent Park communities so each person has an opportunity to achieve their full potential. And our mission is to ensure that there's accessible, a friendly environment that welcomes everyone regardless of their income level or background. We are proud to say and we take great pride in the fact that we are a free of charge organization. Some of the many programs that we offer at Cabbage Town Youth Centre are summer and March break camps, the St. James Town Community Action Program for children and their parents, youth empowerment, our renowned boxing club. We probably have the best performing arts program in the city of Toronto, a variety of sports clubs and sport leagues, and an after four program. Our camp program sets us apart from any of the other not-for-profit organizations downtown. We reach anywhere between 1,200 and 1,600 children, and they come for the entire seven-week program. And that expands into the West End, Alexander Park, Rexdale, and two Scarborough locations. We all know that St. Jamestown is a vibrant, diverse community. It has a population of 56,000 residents. 90% of the residents live in apartment dwellings. 24% are children and youth. 21% are seniors. And 43% of the community speak languages other than English and French. And although we're known as a youth centre, we have been offering programs for children, youth, their parents, families, and seniors for many, many years. Our current challenge, we have a funding crisis. No funds to deliver programs by the end of this month. Our maintenance and upkeep of the physical plant as well as an aging facility. But more importantly, we have a lack of administrative infrastructure supports. There's an executive director and programming staff, and yet we're a very large organization. We need some more resources full time. The impacts of closing the community center would mean that hundreds of children, youth, and their families would no longer have access. Regent Park and St. Jamestown already have access to recreation challenges. St. Jamestown, in addition to lack of access, has a lack of space and parkland. Meaningful community buildings between and amongst new Canadians and Indigenous communities would be lost. Child poverty and crime will continue to soar. Burden to many, many organizations that use our uh, facility, which include Council Fire, would no longer have access. We employ more than 100 youth. Uh, at our centre, that would be lost, and of course this already has sparked a community uproar. Our financial situation, our reserves have been depleted. The youth centre is now in a $125,000 line of credit. Grants from governments have been challenging or remain the same over the years, while cost of operating have drastically increased. One of our two provincial grants has ended in March of 2019, and there has been no replacement grants for which to apply. But the biggest impact is the impact that we felt from the City of Toronto years ago, moving from a major grant to a minor grant. Um, and that decrease was about 75% in addition to having access to a half FTE caretaker from Parks, Forestry and Recreation. Just a quick look at our income and our expenses between 2018 and 19. Uh, in 2019, you'll see that our revenues have drastically decreased while our total expenses have increased. Our immediate need, 
We are requesting 350,000 emergency funding to get us through the year so that we could regroup and strategize. The Center's Board of Directors and myself will continue with great effort to fundraise, but will require seed money from all levels of government. Toronto cannot afford to lose this valuable asset. I attended Budget Committee all last week and heard mandates from several divisions that include working with Indigenous populations, at-risk youth, poverty, refugees and new immigrants, and community safety. This is what the Cabbage Town Youth Centre is all about. So thank you for your time, and I also want to make a special thank you to Councillor Wong Tam, who's uh, led this for us and provided her support, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to come and speak with you. I know you, from my days as budget chief that uh, you have a very tough, tough job to do. Uh, and I appreciate you hearing us today. Um, I care a lot about the city and issues with the city, but it's pretty rare for me to come to a city committee and make deputations. And the fact that I'm here today is really a reflection of my commitment to and passion for an understanding of the need that the Cabbage Town Youth Centre uh, fills. It's interesting, uh, Herb Perk is here this morning, former commissioner of, of uh, Parks and Recreation, and I was saying to him, we had a lot of conversations over the years about CYC, understanding its value, and working to uh, address the funding issue. CYC came up in a very grassroots way and uh, for many years operated without uh, any contribution from uh, orders of, of government. Um, in many ways that's its strength, or was its strength, but at the same time also um, its weakness. Some of the procedures there were frustrating. Uh, I know for uh, me as a city councillor way back when and, uh, and, and for city staff. A lot of work has been done in that regard. The leadership which failed, resisted, uh, living within the, the rules and regulations that public funders require is no longer there and in fact has been gone from there for a couple of years. A new board, new staff, um, that um, piece of, of the history has, has been eliminated. Um, this center, CYC, which in my neighborhood you describe as the club behind the beer store um, in the alley off, off Parliament Street has, has been there meeting needs as the city has struggled in other ways to meet the needs, particularly thinking about St. Jamestown, and which in its early days had no publicly funded facilities. There were fitness clubs, tennis courts, swimming pools, um, which the then uh, reasonably, reasonably affluent uh, residents paid for within their, their rent. As St. Jamestown has, has changed and has become uh, homes for many families, many diverse families, um, I know that the city has, has struggled to increase the resources. It started with an extension to Rose Avenue School, the library, the community center, the swimming pool, all those things are very important and, and I know a lot of work has, has gone into to, um, getting them, but they're not adequate to meet all the needs of that community. And CYC has a relationship with the most vulnerable in the community and to lose it would be detrimental to our somewhat fragile community. I mean, we talk about St. Jamestown, we talk about Regent Park, 
But within the, the, um, the row housing, the single family housing, there's a lot of social housing, a lot of supportive housing, and there are needs there, there as well. So I know this isn't on the agenda today as a specific um, amount in your budget, but um, I would urge you to have uh, the parks, I'm not sure uh, the description, to have staff social in social development meet with the leadership at the at CYC and to uh, pull in other funders. I think that all orders of government have have a history of of some funding here and really come up with uh, a resolution um, that can move this important resource forward. It's really a bargain for the city in terms of what what happens there. And uh, it's very important to the life of the community. Thank you. You have uh, less than four minutes. Yes. Yep. Thanks. Uh, my name is Ryan Dudnick, and I'm the Wasanaben Program Coordinator at Toronto Council Fire Native Cultural Centre in Regent Park. The Wasanaben Program, it's a self-development program that offers one-on-one -on -one support for at-risk urban Indigenous youth ages 13 to 18. By accessing the services and supports offered in the Wasanaben program, youth will learn goal setting, leadership skills, violence prevention, and how to make informed choices that would lead to healthier lifestyles and personal success. The Wasanaben program began a partnership with the Cabbage Town Youth Center and Cabbage Town Boxing Club in 2016, where Council Fire youth attend twice a week from 4 till 6 p.m. Boxing has proven to be a popular activity amongst the Indigenous youth in the community and has allowed part, uh, Council Fire's partnership with the Cabbage Town Youth Center to grow. This partnership now includes our Little Embers after school, after school Program, which is for youth ages seven to 12, and our Youth Wellness Program, which serves youth up to 29 years old. From Tuesday to Friday each week, Council Fire has one of our youth programs accessing the Cabbage Town Youth Center. One of the most valuable things about the boxing program is that it allows for me to engage with youth outside of an office setting and to build the foundation of a relationship where youth will feel comfortable opening up and accessing more of the services that the Wasanaben program has. Getting a teenager to see the value in coming into an office and accessing the supports is difficult. But getting a youth to go to boxing, building a relationship with them and having the opportunity to talk while working out together, it allows for a more natural dialogue to take place in a less formal environment. I've seen firsthand the tremendous impact that having the Cabbage Town Youth Center has had on the success of the Indigenous youth that I work with. The youth continue to develop their self-discipline, they've shown increased self-confidence, improved physical fitness, and developing healthy relationships. With all the programming at Council Fire, we incorporate the, the four medicine wheel teachings. The boxing program contributes, contributes to these by addressing the physical, mental, and emotional needs of the youth. By addressing this need, it directly supports Toronto Council Fire's culturally based programming by providing balance to the medicine wheel teachings. The Cabbage Town Boxing Club is special. If I were to try, try to run a boxing program at another gym, it would never be the same. Sure, there'd be punching bags, there'd be equipment, but what it doesn't have is the amazing staff and the community atmosphere. Coach Johnny there, he's incredible. Uh, he's an Olympian. He's able to inspire, he push, and connect with the youth that are involved in his programs uh, in, in ways that others, uh, they can't. Johnny has shown that he has a knowledge of Indigenous issues from previous partnerships with Native Child and Family Services and the Native Men's Residents. The Cabbage Town Youth Center and Cabbage Town Boxing Club have created a community experience for the residents of Cabbage Town, St. Jamestown, and Regent Park that can't be replicated. I have lived in St. Jamestown for the last 12 years, and I've worked in Regent Park for the last nine. I know the negative impact of losing this building would do to Council Fire, the Indigenous youth that I work with, and the surrounding communities. I appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of Council Fire and the Indigenous youth that I serve. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions, Councillor Wong-Tam? Uh, 
Yes, thank you very much, and thank you for the deputation. Um, you're largely here because there was a request and a motion that was moved uh, back in, uh, in, in, in December uh, asking the city staff to come out to meet and engage with uh, the staff of CYC to determine whether or not there was an interim um, uh, funding fix that we can come in to provide some additional supports. Is that not correct? Correct. And did the staff reach out to you, and did that conversation ever take place? No. And so we were, they were also supposed to produce a, a report coming back to this particular budget uh, process on uh, January 15th, and that has not been done yet. Correct. Uh, we will be having an emergency meeting this week, uh, but no, uh, there has not been any communication since that motion. Okay, so we're, so we're, we're a little bit behind. Right, I need to catch up now. So with respect to the $350,000, if, if the City of Toronto and, and, and the Budget Committee was able to put aside that $350,000, that will sustain your operation for one year, is that correct? Correct. And that will allow you to, to find the time to build a more sustainable funding plan, is that correct? Yes. So you're not necessarily asking for the City of Toronto to fund you in perpetuity, although that might be nice, but right now, as it, is, it exists, it's a, it's a one-time injection of cash of 350000 to keep those 1,600 kids uh, in those programs for the summer and for this year? It, it's our immediate request. Uh, you have a second motion, of course, yep. for uh, the AOC uh, facility motion uh, later on to economic development. But I'm hoping that at some point we could reinstate our major grant instead of it becoming a minor contribution to the center. And can you give us some history to this major and minor grant status and why the trans uh, yes, transition? Yes, so as you may know, uh, I was a manager of Parks and Recreation for 32 years with the City of Toronto. Uh, I've known Cabbage Town Youth Centre for that whole duration. Uh, one of my responsibilities was to actually facilitate the major and minor grants uh, through Parks and Recreation. Over time, uh, that grant system went from one division to another back and forth. So at the time, uh, Parks and Recreation had that uh, responsibility where actually Barbara Hall was the mayor at the time and her perk was the commissioner. Um, they supported the CYC by giving them about $155,000 a year. It's dwindled now down to $39,000 a year. The immediate impact of that cut was that we closed the facility back about 10 years ago every evening and every weekend. Uh, the impact now is that we've used all our reserves and we've been able to keep going uh, until now. And with respect to closing the, the center during the evening on the weekends, wouldn't you say that those are the critical hours? Absolutely. That after four program? Absolutely. And, and that's how we also divert youth um, away from guns and gangs, away from at-risk behavior. Is that not correct? Absolutely. And I, I, I'd like to mention that the, we get funding from the province and the federal government, but those grants are specific to a project. The City of Toronto grant, although it's specific to running children and youth programming, allows us to run throughout the year those types of activities where, for example, we would get uh, Canada summer jobs would be just for the summer camp. We would get province money just for summer camp. So they're project specific, unlike the City of Toronto, which gives us flexibility for all year programming. And with respect to uh, the this, this city funding, recognizing that there's been a 75% reduction of city dollars in those fundings, over that period of time, you folks have been able to sustain themselves even, even with the reduction of city dollars. How were you able to do that? We, we've used up all our fundraising reserves. And, with and, and not hired any full-time employees. And so at this point in time, like you, you are suggesting that we, 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 we come to the table, we meet with you, but you're also putting some real estate on the table. Is that not correct? Abs absolutely. And, and what, the, what might that look like? Uh, in terms of the second motion, is that, is uh, that what you're talking about in terms of the possibility of Cabbage Town Youth Centre going into um, the uh, Association of a Community Centre? That's uh, we would, the board uh, has agreed to give the property over to the City of Toronto in lieu of us becoming one of the uh, AOC facilities. And if there was, um, the, uh, having spoken to city staff, they, they, their, their early indication was, why should the City of Toronto step in to save an organization that lost provincial funding? That was sort of like the, the quick high-level notes of the response. How would you respond to that? 
Well, as I had mentioned, uh, those provincial and federal grants are typically project-based. Uh, I've been alerting the City of Toronto for a, a few years, actually, uh, as I was the Executive Director in 2016, as I was the City Councilor uh, responsible for Cabbage Town, I've been alerting them that CYC is, in fact, in danger. So and how I would respond to that is all those mandates that they've talked about is everything that we address. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just a couple questions myself. Um, so you mentioned, I know we're getting a report coming next week um, from staff and you, you haven't had the opportunity to sit down with them at this point, is that correct? Correct. So again, I will, I will, I will be having a conversation with staff. You're, you're okay. I assume, you, first of all, you haven't provided things like uh, your the audited financial statements over the last five years, and you'd be, yes, willing, you'd yes. be willing to do so? Yes, we, we are completely eligible. Uh, we meet all the City of Toronto's criteria, so that includes being reporting to all the financial... So you, you'd be well, you, you have those available? Cause Absolutely. That f to be over the, let's say, last five years? Yes. As a minimum, okay. With regard to the $350,000, how's it going to be spent? Uh, well, uh, we'll... we'll open up our doors in the evenings and the weekends, and we'll bring back all the programs that are no longer uh, operating right now. We're really just down to two programs right now instead of all the ones that I've, I've highlighted. So we would reinstate uh, a lot of those programs. Um, and we also need to create some type of administrative infrastructure. So you have, you have a full breakdown of how that $350,000 will be spent yes. this year? Um, so just, again, uh, recognizing that, number one, you great organization, been around for 50 years. There are many across the city. I have one on my ward, uh, the West Scarborough uh, Community Center, same kind of history. Um, and they, th we don't provide any extra funding to them also. So I, I get concerned when we start giving you know funds to well-needed organizations, but then there's uh, other impacts across the city. So. How did we get to this point? Um, this organization has been here for the last 50 years, been fairly successful, I believe, in, in the community. Um, is it just about the loss of, say, provincial funding? Or, I mean, how did we get to this yeah. point where, you're, where you need these funds to yeah. survive? Mr. Chair, I think the biggest impact is when the City of Toronto went down uh, to a minor uh, contribution or grant. Now, uh, at the time, the administration wasn't reporting. Uh, and following city policy, so it was taken away. Uh, but that hasn't been the case since 2016. We've been uh, com completely eligible in reporting and reporting and meeting all of the criteria of the City of Toronto. And at the end of the day, it's all about the kids. And there's been so much more development in the downtown core, and nothing really has come our way to assist with the with the access issue in both Regent Park and uh, St. Jamestown. Great, and just last question. Uh, you mentioned that all the programming that the CYC provides is free of charge, but doesn't the Boxing Club charge uh, at all? Not for children or youth, and it's okay. a contribution that people make if they choose to. So is that, now is that part of CYC? It or is, is it we're one organization. It is all one organization. Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Okay, so just on Council the Indiana. question, the $350,000, what percentage of that is for salaries? Um, that would probably be, well, first of all, we don't even have an executive director paid anymore because I've had to take myself off of uh, payroll as of the end of September. So we need to find an executive director because I actually, I'd like to retire at some point soon. Um, so we would need funding for an executive director and we're hoping that we could at least hire one other full-time staff for operations. And the rest of it would be uh, for all the programs uh, part-time staff, again, for the evenings and weekends. Um, and again, the reason why it's heavier in terms of the administrative budget is because all of the other grants that we receive are, in fact, for program project-based uh, activities already. We just don't have an infrastructure. So the majority will be going to salaries? Uh, that's because we don't yeah. have an infrastructure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You know the questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again, right. Councillor Wong Tam. Next will be um, we have Susan Craig, Jeffrey Milos or Milos, and Julia Friedman. And I hope I pronounced that closely. So Susan Craig, welcome. 
you'll have five minutes. Um, good day, councillors. Uh, my name is Sue Craig, and I'm speaking on behalf of myself and of the People's Climate Movement, not meeting, uh, of which I'm a member. If you don't know who the People's Climate Movement is, uh, we organized what I believe is the first climate march in Toronto in September of uh, 2014, and we've been working away on climate issues ever since. Uh, I thank you for giving citizens the opportunity to speak to the proposed city budget for 2020. Um, I'd like to uh, ask councillors to increase the funding for Transform TO, which in itself is a program that was developed with a lot of public input and public support. And I'd like to emphasize that this can be done and ought to be done without sacrificing the other programs aimed at making our city more equitable and livable. I would like to sincerely thank the Mayor and Council for broaching the subject of increasing property taxes above the uh, minimal kind of rate at which they had been increasing. This is a step in the right direction, and the sky didn't fall, eh? Um, and now that you've broken the ice with that vote last month, I suggest it is time to be bold and visionary and uh, increase property tax some more. Um, we are already paying much less tax in neighboring jurisdictions, and apparently the amount of spending per capita of population is going down. That is not good. So why not go to 5%? Do I hear you gasping? Seriously, 5% of anything isn't really that much, is it? And given the reluctance of councils past to raise the funds we truly need to maintain and improve our city, 5% would be more than justified. It would cost me, for example, about $350. But what's $350 when you're already paying over $7,000? Um, if we don't invest major funds now, both in Transform TO and in the services that could make our city more equitable, we will pay a lot more later. The thing about a property tax increase is that you don't have to build in new infrastructure to raise the tax as you would with many alternative forms of tax. Building in the new infrastructure for new types of tax usually results in diverting tax dollars away from public spending, even if it is only into paper and computers and private consulting that would not otherwise be needed. Sometimes this is a lot of infrastructure and in itself not environmentally sound. That said, the parking levy and the stormwater levy both sound like good ideas to me that ought to be fairly straightforward to implement without the need for expensive help from the private sector. In general though, as imperfect as it is, I say increased property tax is the way to levy the funds that we need to rebuild the city that works. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Seeing no questions, thank you. Thank you. Next will be Jeffrey Milos. Uh, this will be a, a joint presentation between the two of us. Uh, um, and you are? Friedman? Joya. Okay, great, thank you. How, do you. how do you pronounce your first name? Joya. Joya, great, thanks. So um, I'm here to talk to you today about the development and services budget. Um, this, this briefing is a professional quality presentation, but it does not invite critical questioning. We shouldn't let that soporific facade blind us to the important implications for 2020 and beyond. Mayor and Council are talking about raising taxes. Throughout the budget and other accountability documents, we read terms like financial sustainability, fiscal responsibility, well-run city, evidence-based practices, investing in neighborhoods, transparency, and trust to be earned. It's the responsibility of committees like this one to follow through on the intentions on those intentions and to promote good value for taxpayer dollars. 
It's our collective civic duty to hold decision makers responsible and accountable for their spending. Infrastructure and Development Services has proposed a $1.2 billion operating budget. The lion's share of that budget, 42%, is for fire services, which are, of course, essential. To be clear, that 42% represents about half a billion dollars per year. That yearly half a billion dollars deserves a lot more scrutiny that is, than is so far in evidence. Toronto Fire Services in particular rightly enjoys very high level of public support. We all love the fire department for good reason. They're often our first responders and we rely on those services when we need help. We have such high confidence in Toronto Fire that we're sometimes reluctant to critically assess Toronto Fire budget requests. But the City of Toronto Act gives committees like this one the responsibility to undertake those uncomfortable assessments to ensure good taxpayer value. I don't want to spend a lot of this committee's time, but I will illustrate my concerns with two examples of opportunities for improvement and transparency. I hope these examples will encourage this committee to take a deeper dive into the details of the fire department's requisition. Firstly, I want to discuss metrics with you. Like all departments, the fire department uses KPIs, key performance indicators, to monitor the health and effectiveness of its operations. Those KPIs have great significance for this committee because they are used to justify spending and to drive new programs that achieve important goals and objectives. It's therefore imperative that the goals be evidence-based and the KPIs have meaningful outcomes, have relevance to meaningful outcomes. Several pre previous speakers have echoed the importance of focusing on outcomes. The primary metric used by Toronto Fire is response time. In 2019, every one of the Toronto Fire Service's service levels was, res was related to response time. That metric is so pervasive that the Fire Department operational budget cannot be properly assessed without a thorough understanding of the underpinnings of response time. For that reason, response time deserves this committee's careful deliberation. Response time is a traditional metric with intuitive appeal. We expect shorter arrival times to equal lives saved. What better budget justification could there possibly be? Except that response time is a poor proxy for outcomes. The relationship between shorter response time and improved outcomes is an unsupported assumption. The value of the response time metric is a controversial topic in scholarly EMS literature. Toronto Fire has no evidence to support the underlying assumptions. In the vast majority of situations, shorter response times do not correlate with improved outcomes. The primary metric used by the fire department is neither outcomes-based nor risk-justified. A few years ago, Toronto Fire set the objective of shaving a few seconds off its response time of about six and a half minutes. In response to legally mandated disclosure, Toronto Fire was unable to justify the primary metric that supports its budget of half a billion dollars. Toronto Fire has already captured more than 80% of the available efficiency. The 80-20 rule applies here. Incremental improvements are disproportionately expensive. Toronto Fire has apparently not estimated the incremental cost or, the, or assessed the benefits with the uh, improvements in response time that they've suggested. What's more, scholarly research suggests that response times below eight minutes have negligible impact on outcomes. Toronto Fire is already at six and a half minutes. How much money are we talking about, really? Again, in response to legally mandated disclosure, Toronto Fire could not estimate the costs or benefits of the planned response time improvements. I encourage this committee to demand an answer to that question. I hope this committee will ask Toronto Fire what benefit the city is purchasing with these uncosted incremental improvements. Based on Toronto Fire responses so far, the answer appears to be that we are buying expensive bragging rights that have little impact on quality of life. Toronto Fire will say that response times are a standard of the National Fire Protection Association. 
that's true, but it's potentially misleading. The city does not subscribe to that particular NFPA standard for compliance purposes. Which brings me to my second area of concern. Superficial justifications. Toronto Fire is fond of referring to NFPA to justify expenditures. What they do not refer to are rec compliance requirements, and there's a big difference. I will close with one small example to illustrate my concern about superficial justifications. At Station 333, near my home, there's a secure area on the east side of the lot. I have a great view from my balcony. This secure area was presumably justified by NFPA standard 1451, which, if adopted, would require that all field training exercises shall be conducted in an area that is secure. In fact, this NFPA standard is among the standards not adopted by the city for compliance. In practice, field training exercises take place on the unsecured tarmac in front of the station. The secured area mostly protects the private automobiles of the station employees. Toronto Fire used a similar gambit last year in its consultation with the Board of Health. I suggest to you that some of the expenditures tagged with NFPA justifications are candidates for deeper dives. How many other weak justifications could there be in a half a billion dollar budget? We won't know unless a committee like this one asks the right questions. Finally, there may be a temptation to rely on, Ontario Fire, on the Ontario Fire Marshal to police the efficiency and effectiveness of Toronto Fire operations. With great respect to the professionalism of both men, my confidence in that oversight relationship is not strengthened by the relationship, by the knowledge that Ontario Fire Marshal John Pegg and Toronto Fire Chief Matt Pegg are brothers. The City of Toronto Act requires committees like this one to ensure fiscal responsibility. Despite its outstanding reputation, the fire department must not be an exception to the requirements of good, government, go, good governance and thorough oversight. Proper oversight can only happen if we are willing to probe beneath the surface of soporific budget presentations. We're failing in our civic duty if we fail to do so. We're talking about a pool of half a billion dollars at a time when Council is contemplating tax increases. I encourage you to ask the uncomfortable questions that will lead to the fiscal responsibility demanded by the City of Toronto Act. Until we begin asking those questions, opportunities for improvement will remain hidden. I urge this committee to dig deeper into spending that it's tagged with NFPA requirements. In particular, ask about the cost of response time improvements and their relevance to outcomes. It's important. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, next three people will be Joel Klassen, Eli Aaron, and Keith Stewart. So we'll begin with Joel. Most of my deputation is going to be showing a video that another community member has made. Okay. Um, so I'm just asked for some help with that. As long as it's within the five minutes? Yes. Good morning, uh, Budget Committee. Um, I, uh, my name is Joel Clausen. I work with Young Street Mission, and I'm a member of the Social Development Plan in Regent Park. Uh, you're going to hear a number of deputations uh, today from members of the Social Development Plan you already have. And uh, I just wanted to, to uh, underline Young Street Mission's support for those, uh, for the, the, the funding ask for the Social Development Plan. Um, it's quite an ambitious plan. It's a network that brings together agencies and residents from 
across the community, and it needs a, a it's, it's growing a lot of energy in the community, as you've seen, and it needs a lot of support. So again, just ask for your support to put that funding ask inside the budget so, to it, so that it can be uh, passed and the, uh, that the support can be given to the community. So this is, I'm a, a co-chair of, there's, there's four different working groups. I'm co-chair of the community building working group in that plan. And this is uh, Neon Kim, and she's the co-chair of the safety working group. So I'm gonna play her, her uh, uh, message to you. She's not able to be here today. Hi, I'm here to ask you to support the budget for Region Park Social. Don't have sound on it. Um, uh, we have technical services. Try to get some sound. I just turned it up. I, I could hear it earlier. Hi. I'm here to ask you to support the budget for Region Park Social Development Plan. My name is Nayeon Kim and I am a resident in Ward 13 and I'm a co-chair for Safety Network out of the Social Development Plan. When I moved to Region Park two years ago, someone rushed over to introduce herself and invited me to a block party around the corner. She asked me to come out and meet new neighbors. That moment still stays with me. I wondered how many neighborhoods in Toronto um, could one expect that kind of welcome? After a few weeks following that warm welcome came a shooting in my back alley and then another one on my street uh, a few weeks later. When I, went, I, when I went down to ask the police who looked like a supervisor to me what had just happened, he mentioned despite the revitalization there are still bad people in our community and it's not a safe neighborhood. This summer, a bullet from another shooting went through my brother's car. And on the night of Christmas, I came home to see my street taped off for a crime investigation. And then on New Year's Day, we tragically lost a 21-year-old young man to a senseless shooting that marked the city's first homicide of the decade. In 2018, Toronto's homicide was a record high at a rate of 3.11 per 100,000 people. Now that's higher than that of New York City. Regent Park is home to 10,000 Torontonians. Mothers in Regent Park are mourning. They're afraid to send their children to grocery stores. It's become normal to experience the abnormality of reliving trauma of losing their children or friends of their children in Regent. 60% of children under the age of 17 in Region Park live in poverty, compared to 27% across Toronto. And while the educational attainment of residents in Region Park is on par with the rest of Toronto, the average household here makes 42,000 when the rest of Toronto um, makes 60,000 on average. Through the Region Park Social Development Plan, hundreds of residents have been coming out and spending countless afternoons and evenings to find solutions to the to these very issues that affect us every day. Addressing safety concerns and gun violence by reaching out to the most disengaged youth in our community and supporting mothers with resources. Creating more jobs and spaces for residents to connect in our community and improving access to information. Through this work, we're continuing to make sure that Region Park is a community where everyone belongs. And as well, this social development plan model could be used to benefit the um, other upcoming revitalizations across the city. So I hope the committee will support this critical investment in our neighborhood, a neighborhood that has always been best known to be a t closely knit community where neighbors look after each other, uh, each other, just like the day I moved to Regent Park two years ago. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Questions? I, I maybe just want to add br briefly um, that, uh, um, so this network is, is growing, it's, it's still fragile. About, people are putting a lot of effort into it, as she said. Uh, and they are doing that on the understanding that there has been commitments and promises made by the city that haven't been fulfilled in the past, and they, they, it's really important to get that funding in place so that that momentum can build. And 
it could well be relevant for neighborhoods across the city, uh, this kind of thing. I'm not aware that it's been done before. We'll have to wrap up, thank you. Yeah. And um, it's, it's very valuable. Thank you. Councillor Longtown. Uh, yes, thank you, Joe, for your deputation and for the deputations for those who were presented by video. Uh, with respect to the Regent Park revitalization um, being the first of the City of Toronto, uh, Alexander Park and, uh, and, and followed by uh, uh, Lawrence Height, with respect to the social development plan that's required, uh, if the City of Toronto does not fund the social development plan, um, which I believe was co uh, was created and co-led by the City of Toronto and the community together. Um, what message does that send to those who are actually in Alexander Park and Lawrence Heights for their massive TCHC revitalization? Yeah, I think if they see that, uh, like for this biggest revitalization in the city and the first, like you say, I think if they see that that commitment isn't there uh, on the part of uh, City Council, uh, it will also be, uh, it'll let the wind out of their sails a bit. I'm not sure exactly what kind of community momentum is building there, but I definitely see that in Regent Park, there's a lot of potential, and I think that could be replicated elsewhere. And with respect to the Regent Park being touted as this international success story, I know that the mayor has talked about it, and the previous councillor, um, as, as well as Daniels Corporation's TCHC, it's oftentimes sort of held up as the example um, without the social development plan and the, f and the operationalization of that plan, do you think the City of Toronto and all the actors, such as the Mayor and everybody else, even the local councillor, or TCHC or Daniels, do you think we'd still be able to state that claim that we are an, an international success story? I mean, you can see, like, there's, there's a lot of good stuff happening. There's, there's definitely things to point to for success that, that I've heard other community members mention. And uh, there is this growing momentum of, of community coming together in a, in a new way. The communities always come together, but there's some new things happening. But uh, we also know that there's tremendous mourning uh, going on in the community. A lot of young people have been lost in the last... Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Eli Aaron. Uh, my name is Eli Aaron. I am the budget lead at the Toronto Youth Cabinet, our city's official youth advisory body. The Toronto Youth Cabinet uh, would like to comment on how the budget addresses the implementation of the poverty reduction strategy, but unfortunately that information has not been made available to date. The Toronto Public Library's youth hubs provide programming, assistance with homework and access to technology to teens in neighbourhood improvement areas. Last year, a briefing note determined up to five youth hubs could be opened within a year if the funding was available. This budget proposes the addition of only two youth hubs. At a cost of $230,000 each, it would certainly be possible to uh, open five youth hubs in 2020 and accelerate the implementation of this valuable service to vulnerable youth. We are disappointed to see for the second year in a row, the recommended budget does not include the open hours plan, which has been approved by the Toronto Public Library Board uh, to increase the number of weekly open hours at libraries across the city. This plan is a component of the council adopted poverty reduction strategy and at minimum phase one of the open hours plan should be funded. On the capital side of the budget, uh, transportation services is of concern. 44% of the transportation services capital plan is to be spent on the Gardner Expressway, while the road rehabilitation backlog is set to hit nearly three and a half billion dollars over the next 10 years. The young people of today will have to live with the consequences of this decision. It would be irresponsible to prioritize a few kilometers of highway 
at the expense of allowing the entire city's road network to deteriorate. The TTC is also facing significant capital funding challenges. Even with the additional city building fund revenue, there is a sizable funding gap. Youth rely heavily on public transit and leaving critical state of good repair and growth initiatives unfunded will impact the reliability and the capacity of the system. Two examples of this are investments in replacement buses and 60 additional streetcars. Without these investments, the entire surface transit network and the mobility of those who use it will be at risk. Youth and post-secondary transit fares are proposed to increase by 4.7%, which is more than double the rate of inflation. Transit riders will contribute over 1.2 billion dollars to the City of Toronto budget, while drivers who utilize the city's transportation infrastructure will do so at no cost. This is clearly a double standard that needs to be addressed from a fiscal, equity, and environmental perspective. Council needs to reintroduce the vehicle registration tax and explore a commercial parking levy, both of which the city has the authority to implement. To ensure the city budget works for youth, the library budget should include five youth hubs and phase one of the open hours plan. The transportation budget should address the needs of the entire city's road network. Critical TTC capital investments must be funded. Finally, Council should charge drivers to avoid the above inflationary fare increase and make necessary investments in the TTC's capital plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Seeing no questions, we'll move on to uh, Keith Stewart. We probably, just to let everybody know, we probably have uh, enough room to do uh, one more deputation and Russell after this, and then we'll be taking our lunch break. Uh, thanks so much for having me uh, for this opportunity to address you. My name is Keith Stewart. I'm a senior energy strategist with Greenpeace Canada. I also teach a course on energy and environmental policy at the University of Toronto. And normally when I come to budget consultations, it's to ask elected officials like yourselves to spend money to address the climate crisis and then leave it up to you to find a way to pay for it. But that's not why I'm here today. Toronto City Council has declared a climate emergency and has a respectable plan to begin addressing it. However, as my colleagues at the Toronto Environmental Alliance have pointed out, and I support everything Heather Marshall told you earlier today, um, it isn't even close to fully funded. Dealing with climate crisis, the climate crisis is the task of our generation and it's gonna be something we have to do over the long term, but we have to start today. Um, so I want to offer up a suggestion on where you can get the resources we need to respond to the climate emergency using the polluter pay principle. I'd however like to start with a story in the current issue of Time magazine um, entitled The Reason Fossil Fuel Companies Are Finally Reckoning with Climate Change. In the story, the CEO of Shell Oil is asked about the revelations that oil companies have known about the threat posed by climate change since the 1970s. He responded, quote, yeah, we knew, everybody knew, and somehow we all ignored it, end quote. Except that last part isn't entirely true. Exxon, Shell, Chevron, and the rest didn't actually ignore it. Instead, like big tobacco before them, they spent millions to fund campaigns to cast doubt on climate science and to lobby against environmental policies. These campaigns to delay action and sell more oil were wildly successful, which is one of the reasons that climate change is now gonna be so costly to deal with. They did this with their eyes wide open. I recently came across an internal Shell document from 1998 where they were forecasting what the world would look like in 2020, what it would look like today. The very clever people at Shell successfully predicted that climate-fueled extreme storms would lead to a wave of climate litigation against oil companies on the grounds that the company's own scientists had told them this would happen. They also foresaw a youth-led movement of what they called vigilante environmentalists that would try to hold big oil to account in the same way big tobacco was. 
So to be clear, 22 years ago, Shell predicted the rise of Greta Thunberg and the wave of climate lawsuits sweeping the globe. Like the case before the courts currently from municipalities like New York, San Francisco, Oakland, and Baltimore, and being contemplated by Toronto, Vancouver, and Victoria. The big polluters have known for decades they'd be asked to help pay for New York's $119 billion seawall, or perhaps to contribute towards the upgrades to Toronto's sewer system and repair flooded basements, to expand and electrify the TTC, and to install EV chargers throughout the city. To be clear, no one is saying that they should pay for all of it, but just like Tobago, Big Tobacco has had to pay $270 billion to cover a portion of smokers' health care costs, oil companies should have to pay their fair share. Because let's not forget that while you and I measure our carbon footprint in kilograms, they measure theirs in tens of millions of tons. We're not starting from scratch here. Toronto City staff are currently preparing reports on the long-term costs of climate change to the city and legal options for making big polluters pay their fair share. Those reports are scheduled to come back to the Infrastructure and Environment Committee in March. I recognize this won't help you balance this year's budget, although measures like the parking lot levy would. Um, but rebuilding a more climate resilient city is going to take years and decades. And it's going to be very expensive. Indeed, the only thing more expensive than dealing with climate change is failing to deal with it. So as you look at the long-term financial and ecological sustainability of Toronto, and as you examine the climate-related costs and vulnerabilities the city is currently facing, I hope you won't ignore this application of the polluter pay principle. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Layton. Thank you very much. Keith, do we have any idea of what the, the scale of the value or the costs associated with climate change are in the city of Toronto? Or so this is one of the things. Any measurement. So the staff is um, currently looking at this, but I would say it's definitely in the billions because not only do we require massive changes to infrastructure, which as you guys know better than most, is expensive. I mean, rebuilding storm sewers, even putting or putting in, you know, more permeable uh, surfaces, very expensive. But also, when you look at the harms from those storms, and scientists actually now have the the ability to sort of like single out what's the con extra contribution of climate change to extreme weather events, like the flooding that happened back in 2013, which according to the Insurance Bureau of Canada cost Toronto, I think about $900 million for one storm. And this is the thin edge of the wedge. These are going to keep happening. They're keep going to keep getting worse. We not only have to make Toronto more resilient to those impacts, but also make sure that Toronto's impact, uh, uh, contribution to that, is reduced, which the city you know, does have a plan to get to zero emissions, so that's a good thing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks. You. I think we'll for one more deputation um, will be Ann Russell. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you for this opportunity to speak today. My name is Ann Russell, and I live in Ward 11. I'm a member of Green 11, which is the Green Neighbours Group in my ward, and we were a signatory of the letter calling on the City of Toronto to declare a climate emergency and commit to accelerated climate action. So I was very thankful uh, last fall when the City Council unanimously voted to declare a climate emergency and accelerate uh, climate action, so thank you for that. Given this declaration and commitment, I am concerned to learn that the proposed 10-year capital spending budget for climate-related actions in the Energy and Environment Division has been reduced by 27 percent from last year. I'm here today to call on the City to review the spending priorities in this budget and increase the proposed 10-year ten ten capital budget for energy and environment climate-related actions. I would also recommend that the City does not delay in the establishment of a dedicated climate fund using viable and fair revenue sources, such as a commercial parking levy and others that have been mentioned here today, while mitigating the impacts of such fees on equity-seeking groups. According to modelling conducted by City staff on greenhouse gas emissions, spending of $2 billion per year is what would be required to achieve an 80 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. In the climate emergency declaration, the City has committed to investigate actions that would get the City to net zero emissions by 2040. 
My understanding is that $150 million in capital spending is proposed for climate action over the next 10 years. This represents a small fraction of the funding that would be required for Toronto to implement the climate actions that we need to take over the coming decade. In the context of a climate emergency, we need to look at the impact of all city spending and decisions on the climate and align our priorities with the goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. For example, I think that we should re reconsider spending $2 billion on the Gardner Expressway. I think that that funding could go to climate-related actions, such as accelerating home energy retrofits, funding the city bike plan, and providing greater access to the fair, fair transit pass and improving transit overall. A reference panel of Torontonians for the Transform TO Implementation Strategy has supported using revenue sources such as a parking levy or a congestion charge to fund Transform TO programs. Rather than delaying until the 2021 budget cycle or later to set up a dedicated climate fund, these or other types of revenue sources should be looked at in this budget to establish such a fund. Becoming a net zero city by 2040 is an ambitious and prudent goal, and Toronto can only achieve this goal with adequate funding for climate-related actions. When I think about how the climate emergency is already having devastating impacts on people's lives, I think about my friends James Halsbauer and Willie Mallet. James and Willie live half the year on the Toronto Islands and half the year in the Philippines. Six years ago, they lost their home in the Philippines when Hurricane, when Typhoon Haiyan struck that country. Haiyan was at that time the strongest storm ever recorded. 6,000 people died as a result of that storm. In the years since Haiyan struck, unprecedented flooding has altered the viability of whole cities and towns in the Philippines, forever changing the economic structure of society. Here in Toronto, James and Willie have spent the, fast few, the past few summers fighting floods on Toronto Island. They have watched thousands of trees die, beaches disappear, and Lyme disease appear on the islands. They have suffered financial, emotional, and psychological toll from these losses. I note that the flooding on Toronto Islands has cost the city over $28 million in repairs and property rehabilitation an amount almost double the proposed annual spending on climate-related rea actions in the proposed budget. Extreme storms, flooding, and uncontrollable wildfires are already having devastating effects on our friends and neighbours in our city and around the world. Funding the actions and strategies that we need to build climate resiliency to mitigate and hopefully prevent catastrophic climate change needs to be scaled up at a pace that reflects the severity of, exi of existing climate impacts and the urgency of action required to safeguard a livable planet. I have to wrap up, please. I urge the city to increase the proposed capital budget for energy environment climate-related actions and establish a dedicated climate fund. Thank you. Thank you. You no questions. Thank you very much for your deputation. And we will be recessing for lunch. We'll be back at 1.30.